Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Subnational Forum on U.S.-India Clean Energy and Climate Action and Cooperation. This is a hybrid event, and whether you're here in person or turning in online, whether this is good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, we're very happy to see you. My name is Catherine Hada, and I'm a visiting senior fellow with the Wadwani Chair at CSIS. CSIS, as many of you know, is a leading global think tank with some 30 geographic and topical programs. And the CSS, CSIS Wadwani Chair in U.S.-India Policy Studies leads the center's work on India. The team focuses on ways to unlock the full potential of the U.S.-India relationship, particularly on cutting-edge issues of interest to both countries. The CSIS Wadwani Chair has also become one of the leading authorities on state-level political and economic issues in India. As a part of our focus, we lead a number of projects to expand U.S. subnational engagement with India. Now, why focus on, U on Indian states and subnational engagement? Well, with 28 states and eight union territories, 22 official languages, and 54 recognized state-based political parties, it can be a real challenge for Americans to follow Indian state-level issues. Yet, it's really worth tracking the states closely. From land use and business licensing to the provision of public health care, Indian states, as is the case with their American counterparts, have tremendous autonomy in setting policies that affect the lives of their citizens. And their actions also determine whether and how the policies that the central government set are implemented. Indian states, similar to their American counterparts, are also fulcrums of creativity, innovation, and initiative. And it's not unusual for policies and programs that are begun in an Indian state, for example, to promote entrepreneurship or improve health care, to later be adopted by the center, just as can happen here in the United States. So subnational cooperation between the United States and India is therefore critical to the success of our vibrant and growing bilateral relationship. And it's also a crucial mainstay of long-term economic growth, sustainable technology innovation, industrial development, and entrepreneurship, and more for both our countries. Our bilateral, subnational U.S.-India cooperation also builds upon the substantial people-to-people -people ties that exist between our two countries, including among members of the growing Indian American community here in the United States who maintain family and other connections throughout India. One of the greatest challenges facing India and the United States and the world is how to mitigate the effects of climate change and advance the deployment of clean energy. As has become even more evident over the past few months, moving towards renewables will also help increase our energy security by reducing reliance on imports. But despite this urgency, both countries face a variety of technical, economic, political, and regulatory challenges to meet their renewables objectives, which leads us to how and why we are here today. The CS IS Wadwani teamwork on subnational clean energy, climate action, and collaboration started following Prime Minister Modi's 2016 visit to the United States, during which he announced an ambitious target for India to produce 175 gigawatts of renewable power by the end of 2022. And this national target has been broken out into smaller targets for each of India's states and territories. In other words, India's success in meeting its laudable national target is linked directly to the success of Indian states in meeting their sub-targets. Through a State Department grant, our team began a series of dialogues asking Indian states to identify some of their most pressing needs in making the transition to renewables. And our approach to this and any issue we work on with Indian states is really rather simple. We just ask the states what it is they need. In this case, many told us they needed to build capacity to enable them to choose the right financing and the most appropriate technologies, to set the right policies and incentives, and to find ways to educate their companies and citizens about the need to change to renewables. And happily, as we always find to be the case, there are partners here in America who can support the Indian state's efforts, including U.S. state governments and entities, universities, national labs, and others. We're proud of our role in bringing these key players together so they can build strong partnerships for the future with their Indian state counterparts. 
The results have been so successful that following the end of our State Department grant in 2019, we've been fortunately funded with a, by a variety of philanthropies and foundations to carry this work forward. And it would be impossible for me to list them all, but I wanted to highlight a few today. To support India's transition to electric mobility, we have, with the assistance of the Climate Works Foundation, sponsored a number of fruitful state-to-state -state dialogues, many of which have led to further exchanges. Gujarat, for example, highlighted the support of both CSIS and Colorado for having strengthened the EV policy that Gujarat published last year. Through our same program, we've connected a number of Indian state governments to NESCOM, the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management, which is a non-governmental organization that leads the work of the multi-state ZEV task force in the United States. This ongoing collaboration among the participating U.S. states and Indian partners has been very fruitful. The SED Fund, which has brought us here together today, has been our partner on a number of key initiatives. Through the fund, MIT is collaborating with Chhattisgarh to do a study on transformer health in an effort to mitigate the state's high cost of transformer failure. MIT is also supporting Madhya Pradesh in efforts to improve weather forecasting to help the farmers of that state better cope with a warming planet. Through SED, we've also opened subnational dialogues on the critical role that long duration energy storage will play in India's transition to renewable energy. And one year ago this month, CSIS, supported by the SED Fund, was pleased to facilitate in the presence of US Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, and India's Minister of New and Renewable Energy, Bhagwant Kuba, the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, between our co-host here today, NASIO, the National Association of State Energy Officials, and ARIAS, who represent Indian state nodal agencies. The MOU will promote coordination and capacity building between state-level energy officials in the United States and India. And I'm delighted to say three participants in that signing event, David Terry, Executive Director of NASIO, Mr. Javeen Kumar Jatani, the Director of ARIAS, and the Indian Joint Secretary for International Relations for the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, Dinesh D. Jagdale, are all here today. And they will be among a number of knowledgeable speakers who will offer their perspectives at this event, a tangible outcome of that NASIO RES MOU. So we have an exciting morning planned. Our keynote speaker, Under Secretary for Energy, David Turk, is going to kick things off by providing an overview of priorities and strategies for advancing U.S. security, energy, and competitiveness. We'll then hear U.S. and Indian perspectives on coordinating central, federal, and state clean energy policies. A second panel will dig more deeply into the role of states in advancing clean energy and climate solutions. Lastly, we will hear from the SED Fund on the role of philanthropic investment in building connections that advance energy transition and climate action. It's our hope and belief that today's discussions will lead to further continued partnerships to the benefit of India, the United States, and the planet. Now, before I sign off and welcome David Terry to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker, I'd really be remiss today if I did not mention our director, Rick Rosso, who is on long scheduled and very well-deserved leave. Uh, he is the Wadwani chair and the principal architect of our U.S.-India subnational engagement on energy, climate, and a whole host of other issues. Deputy Director and Senior Fellow Neela Majain is on maternity leave, and she and our Associate Director, Afina Ashfaq, who's fortunately very much here today, both lead the team's state's work. And Yatin Jain, who's also here, uh, is our program coordinator and research assistant. And I want to give a shout out too to Catherine Moore, our intern. She's an online intern in this COVID age and she's joining us online. Uh, lastly, I just want to give many thanks to Nazio Senior Managing Director, Sandy Fazeli, because we would never have been able to be here without her either. Now, let me welcome David Terry, Executive Director of Nazio, to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. And I, uh, I just want to second a thank you for uh, the Center for Strategic and International uh, Studies uh, partnership for a number of years and uh, welcome all of you here and uh, welcome our uh, colleagues from India and from Arias. Um, we're very fortunate to uh, not only the MOU last year, but the ongoing cooperation. There's much to do and I will second my thank you for Sandy Fazelli. With that, I'd like to uh, introduce our special keynote speaker, uh, Deputy Secretary David Turk from the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, he, along with Secretary Granholm, leads the Department of Energy's really vast research, technology, policy, analytical security efforts um, that the state energy offices across the country and so many companies in the U.S. and globally depend upon for innovation and, uh, and work on a variety of energy issues uh, that we all face. Uh, Deputy Secretary Turk, uh, previously, before coming to the department, was the Deputy Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, leading important studies on a variety of energy topics, including clean hydrogen, which is a particularly important topic to our states, among many others. During the Obama administration, uh, he also uh, helped to lead the Mission Innovation uh, Program, something that NASIO is very committed to and many of our members are, um, and very pleased to see that continue. Uh, uh, he also, uh, for the President's uh, office, uh, helped to lead national security efforts as Deputy National Security Advisor. And uh, I guess the last few interesting items, uh, he was born in Ecuador, uh, grew up in Illinois, but obviously well known as an international energy policy expert and security expert. Deputy Secretary Turk, welcome and thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much, David, for the introduction, and um, thank you to Nazio and CSIS for uh, this terrific event. And I couldn't be happier to be here to help kick things off for what I'm sure will be an interesting set of discussions, an incredibly important set of discussions. And what I would urge all of you, and I know you all will, is these can't just be discussions, they have to be uh, actionable sessions where we're looking for real partnership opportunities. Uh, the world needs the U.S., the world needs India, the world needs the U.S. and India, including and especially on the issues that we're talking uh, about today. So with that in mind, let me just try to set the scene a little bit for those actionable conversations. And let me start just giving you, uh, uh, at least from my perspective, a 30,000 foot landscape viewpoint of what's going on in energy and climate right now. And I think it's important to understand where we're at if we uh, want to get to where we need to, uh, to get to. Uh, the way I like to think about what's going on right now are uh, a set of three interrelated crises when it comes to energy and climate. Uh, the first crisis I'll, I'll highlight is COVID. Uh, COVID is still with us, unfortunately. And while it's had a huge, huge impact on health, on people's lives, literally, people's livelihoods. It's also had an incredibly big impact uh, on energy and what's gone on. Uh, certainly in terms of the energy markets for goods that are traded, commodities that are traded globally, uh, you'll recall, and it seems like an awful long time ago given where oil prices are now, but oil prices were negative for a little while because of COVID. That had never happened before, that is a big, big dynamic, a big whack to the stability of markets more broadly. It also had an impact, and we're still feeling this, uh, on supply chains, including supply cha chains for a lot of the key uh, clean energy technologies that we're using here in the U.S., that we're using in India, that we're using around the world as well. And we're still feeling those impacts. We're still trying to do what we can, certainly from the U.S. government side of things. I know the Indian government others trying to uh, dig out and get to a more uh, state of normalcy, not only in our daily lives, but uh, in our energy lives and when it comes to the clean energy transition. And then you put on top of that what happened more recently with Russia invading Ukraine. And that is certainly a double whammy when it comes to energy and a double whammy when it comes, uh, at least potentially, to the energy transition. So if markets were already out of whack, if supply chains were already out of whack, uh, it just threw that into even greater disarray, a lot of uncertainty uh, into the system. And we're certainly, again, trying to do what we can from the U.S. side to help bring some stability to try to help uh, consumers not only here in the U.S. but around uh, the world. And uh, one data point or one example of what we've tried to do is the largest historic release from our strategic petroleum reserves in the U.S., purposefully done, and we had some good contacts and conversations with Minister Puri and others in India, on that effort to try to bring some stability 
uh, into, the, into the markets and to try to have uh, a rapid orderly transition that doesn't cause a lot of pain to consumers, cause pain to citizens, whether they're in the US, whether they're in Delhi, whether they're anywhere uh, around the world. So those are the two first crises. The third crisis, which has been around a little longer, but we're getting daily, hourly reminders of uh, just how much this crisis is already impacting all of us, is the climate crisis. Uh, certainly, it's a hot day here in DC. It's an even hotter day in London yesterday, historic heat in London. We've had some uh, extraordinary heat uh, in India this year. We've had some, uh, again, extraordinary wildfires here in the U.S. in large parts of the country. We're having significant drought here in the U.S., other parts of the world. We're seeing stronger hurricanes, stronger typhoons. We're seeing extreme weather. Billions and billions of dollars being spent, billions and billions of dollars that could be spent in all sorts of better ways, but we're having to spend that to react to, to adapt to, to try to get ahead of this uh, and try to respond to this. But uh, it's only getting worse. Climate science tells us it's going to get worse even if we get our acts together and even if we get to the 1.5 degree Celsius trajectory uh, that we're not, current, uh, not currently on. So this is the landscape. These are the three crises. Now that's tough. That's a lot to take in on a morning. Um, but it underscores the uh, challenge, but I think it also underscores the opportunity and the responsibility of countries all around the world, businesses, CEOs, community leaders, governors, stepping up and being part of the solution to try to help, uh, not just in the abstract, but help real people's lives and try to help us all transition uh, the, with the pace and the scale that we need to on the, on the clean energy transition side of things. All right, so let me turn now to, uh, uh, again, my perspective on the India-US relationship when it comes to the clean energy uh, transition and climate change efforts. And this is something I've been involved in for many years. I've spent many uh, days and hours uh, in India, in Delhi, and elsewhere. Uh, I've spent a lot of time working with terrific colleagues. I see some here uh, uh, trying to help strengthen the partnership, trying to help strengthen the partnership between our two countries. But even more importantly, I'll get into this even further, try to strengthen the partnership between all levels of our society business-to-business -business relationship, subnational to subnational relationship, people-to-people -people relationship, and a few, uh, few observations, again, for your consideration of you, as you have your discussions uh, today. First observation is, I don't think I've ever seen, not just speaking on the climate and clean energy front, but I, uh, and this is coming, my most recent visit to India was uh, last fall, terrific sets of discussion. This was before the Russia-Ukraine invasion, but I think this largely holds in terms of the fundamentals. I've never seen the relationship between our two countries as strong as it is right now, the fundamentals of that relationship. Uh, certainly when it comes to energy and climate, it was a bit eerie as we're working through our priorities on key technologies and areas that we're focusing on from the U.S. Department of Energy side of things, uh, how much our priorities in terms of the technologies and what we're trying to do dovetail incredibly well with what I heard from the various uh, ministers and ministries that I met with uh, in India. Uh, case in point, we've launched what we've called a series of earth shots at the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy is an innovation powerhouse. We spend an awful lot of money every year, our 17 national labs, really trying to push the envelope to lower costs on key clean energy technologies. The first two of these earth shots that we launched were on hydrogen and long duration uh, storage, trying to drive those costs down dramatically. So on hydrogen down to a dollar per kilogram, that is a huge reduction from where it is right now for electrolysis produced hydrogen. Long duration storage reducing costs 90 percent within this decade so that we have long duration storage as we bring more solar, more wind, more intermittent renewables into the system. What I heard from uh, my Indian counterparts was those are two issues of immense priority uh, from the Indian government side of things. The new hydrogen mission, a relatively new hydrogen mission, it's been around there a little while, incredibly impressed at the levers that the Indian government uh, is using, is planning to use on the hydrogen side. The focus on long duration storage, building off the success of the solar deployment. Uh, a little bit eerie how the technologies of priority not only uh, were the same in our two countries, and I can go on with some other technologies as well that we're focusing on and the Indian government's focusing on, but the thing that I took most heart from 
was the way that uh, what we're doing in the U.S. and what India is doing in India dovetails and fits together. For instance, on hydrogen, we have now $8 billion from the U.S. Uh, Congress through the bipartisan uh, uh, infrastructure law that passed late last year to do hydrogen hubs. We've got another $1.5 billion. We've got other levers to work on the hydrogen side. We've got our labs working to reduce costs of electrolysis at our National Renewable Energy Lab and other labs uh, out there, top-notch researchers working on that. What I heard from Indian colleagues was uh, an ability to use some regulatory means, the ability to use some purchasing power, ability to use the federal government's lever to really get hydrogen uh, reductions at scale there, an interest to build out hydrogen infrastructure, hydrogen manufacturing, solar PV manufacturing for that. Very complementary uh, tools, not the same tools, and that's exciting so that we can use the tools that we have respectively and it can all lead to those cost reductions and the ability for hydrogen or long duration storage or you name the technology to, uh, to accelerate at the pace and scale uh, that we need to on that end. So the fundamentals, I think, of the relationship, not only more broadly, but on energy and climate, uh, are very uh, strong and complementary. Second observation is each partner needs to do whatever we can to help, certainly on the climate change front. We're trying to do everything we can with all the levers we have. The President, President Biden, will be speaking. I'm not sure if this is public yet. I think it's coming public. We'll be speaking today again uh, on climate. Uh, speaking about offshore wind, but speaking about other key technologies uh, out there. Day in and day out, Secretary Granholm, myself, all of us at the Department of Energy focused on this. I mentioned the $8 billion that we have on hydrogen hubs. That's part of a broader package of $70 billion of funding that Congress has invested, has empowered in the Department of Energy to build out all sorts of clean energy technologies. $70 billion, even for a government as big as the U.S. government, is a lot of money. Uh, but that's a historic level of funding. We have never in the history of the Department of Energy had that level of funding across a diverse array of clean energy technologies to leverage, to utilize, to work in partnerships with state and local governments, to work in partnership with industry all across the country. Uh, that's about three times the level of funding we get on an annual basis all over the next five years with a tail significantly behind that. So we're trying to do everything we can from the, from, from the U.S. side. The other thing I took from the Indian side, which I think is uh, terrific, and uh, uh, hopefully you'll get into this as part of your discussions today, is a real interest from the Indian government, and I also met with business leaders, uh, local leaders, NGO leaders, to build out the clean energy manufacturing and supply chains in India. Incredibly exciting, not only for those business opportunities for Indian workers, Indian companies, but I think that is a real strength overall and certainly to be supported by the U.S. government side of things. The more India is not only producing solar PV for itself, but if they can be a powerhouse in those technologies, producing those technologies for others around the world, uh, I think that's not only good in terms of those cost reductions, certainly good for India, but I think an accelerant uh, more broadly for these technologies uh, ar around the world and providing a diversity of supply, a diversity of supply chains that I think is good for the overall resilience, the overall health of the clean energy uh, space, uh, space uh, overall. Um, the other part, the third part I'd uh, put on the table for your consideration uh, in terms of the India-US relationship is the subnational cooperation. Federal governments, the U.S. government, the U.S. Department of Energy working with subnational, subnational working with subnational, all permutations. Um, but I've been around the block enough to know, both in the India context and certainly in the U.S. context, an awful lot uh, of action, real stuff, real people, real people's lives uh, happens with governors, happens with local officials, happens with uh, NGO community leaders. I know that's the case here in the U.S., and we've got some incredible states, incredible local leaders, Nazio playing such an incredible role, uh, catalyzing this kind of uh, effort throughout our country. And I know that's the case on the uh, Indian side as well. Uh, as impressive as some of the ministers are and the staffs are in Delhi, uh, incredibly impressive leadership where the rubber hits the road around uh, India uh, at the subnational uh, level. So I think this is an area I'm particularly excited about this meeting. I think it's an area that we are doing some things, um, but frankly, the people in the U.S., the people in India need us to do even more. 
need us again not just to have discussions but to have concrete actionable ideas how do we take this forward how do we get on the path that we need to from the climate emergency in front of all of us how do we take advantage of the job opportunities the business opportunities uh, the improvement in real people's uh, real people's lives so i think this is an incredibly exciting area and whatever we can do from the u.s government and certainly from the u.s department uh, of energy the only last thing i want to leave you with uh, is an event coming up here in pittsburgh later this year, um, and then there's a nice counterpoint in India next year. Uh, India and the U.S. have been founding members uh, both of something called the Clean Energy Ministerial and also was referenced by David, Mission Innovation. In fact, when Mission Innovation was launched in 2015 on the margins of the Paris Conference, uh, not too many people know this, but the name of Mission Innovation actually came from Pi Prime Minister Modi. There were a series of meetings with then-President uh, Obama, President Hollande, and Bill Gates, all in succession with Prime Minister Modi. I was involved with Secretary Moniz from the Department of Energy back in those days. Uh, I came up with a really crappy name for what would become Mission Innovation. It sounded very bureaucratic. It didn't really roll off the tongue. It had no uh, pizzazz to it. And out of one of those meetings, Prime Minister Modi said, uh, why don't we call it Mission Innovation? And it was such a good name that it stuck, and uh, it's been going since then, not only with India and the U.S., but other key countries around the world doubling their R&D budgets, really leaning in on the clean energy innovation uh, side of things. Every year, ministers get together. Uh, this will happen with uh, Secretary Granholm, with uh, not only ministers from India, but around the world. We've got, I'm told, 15 ministers confirmed, uh, which is great, considering there's only 20-some uh, mission Innovation and Clean Energy Ministerial countries in Pittsburgh this year, September 21st through 23rd. Pittsburgh, for us in the U.S., is a phenomenal example of a uh, city, a local jurisdiction, with a lot of roots in steel, a lot of roots in traditional manufacturing, traditional uh, uh, energy, um, but showing incredible progress in the new clean energy uh, technologies of the future. And that will be on display uh, with the city of Pittsburgh, with Carnegie Mellon, which is a world-class institution at that meeting. I reference it here because India is hosting next year's Mission Innovation and Clean Energy Ministerial uh, Ministerials. And uh, boy, it'd be great if we did a one-two punch here for the world, really showing key countries of the world, India, the U.S., stepping up, working together at all levels, uh, not just the federal governments, not just the subnational governments, uh, private sector to private sector, NGO to NGO, entrepreneurs to entrepreneurs, one, two. The world needs this kind of momentum. The world needs this kind of real world action. There's a lot of commitments out there. Uh, what the world needs even more than that, commitments are important, uh, is real world action and real world progress. And I can't think of two countries uh, better set up to deliver on that and better to cooperate to deliver that at the pace and scale uh, that we need to. So thank you again for having me here today. Uh, thanks to Nazio for all the phenomenal work. CSIS is uh, one of my favorite uh, organizations out there just doing incredible work uh, all around the world. And uh, what a gem to have it here in DC, uh, based in DC. So good luck with all your discussions. And um, again, let's try to think of actionable ideas, things that can actually make a difference in real people's uh, lives out there. That's what we need to do. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much to Deputy, well, he's tall, um, <laughs> to Deputy Secretary Turk for, th for those inspiring opening remarks. Uh, I'd like to invite our next panel up. Uh, we're very lucky to have Jane Nakano, um, who serves as one of CSIS's leading experts um, in the energy uh, security and climate change program leading our panel. Uh, so Jane uh, and, and others, please feel free to come up.
So good morning again, everyone. My name is Jean Nakano. I'm a senior fellow with CSI's energy program here. Um, it was, um, I was, the, what the deputy, deputy secretary just talked about really captured many of the, the points that I wanted to make. So I'm gonna be very efficient here. You know, again, I think it's hard to overstate how important leaderships and actions are at both national and state levels. Uh, two countries are deepening, you know, engagement in clean energy uh, uh, research, deployment, uh, really trying to uh, make a lot of contribution to climate mitigation as well as adaptation these days. And, and I, I'm so thrilled that I'm joined by four leaders uh, from both countries and both at the national and state levels today. Um, and you, know, you do have their full bios uh, in front of you, so I'm not gonna get too much into it. But uh, just quickly, uh, to my immediate left is Bavrum Sivaram. He's the Managing Director and Senior Advisor for Clean Energy and Innovation with the Office of US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. To his left is uh, Joint Secretary Dinesh uh, uh, Jagdale, I'm sorry I'm, if I'm butchering your name, but with uh, India's Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. To his left is Mr. David Terry, who's the Executive Director of NASIO. We've already he heard from him this morning a little bit. Uh, and to his left, last but not least, is uh, Jeevan Jethani. He's the ex Executive Director of ARIAS. Um, and what we, what we are going to do today is to uh, invite uh, the Joint Secretary to give eight to 10 minutes of sort of opening remarks to set the stage, and then we'll turn to Dr. Sivaram, uh, Mr. Terry, and uh, Mr. Uh, Jathani for maybe five to seven minutes of opening remarks, and then we'll have fun. I will get to ask them some questions, and then you can also start thinking about the type of questions you wanna ask um, if the time allows. But so without further ado, Joint Secretary, yes, please, yeah, feel free to, yeah. Very good morning to you all, and greetings from India to all those who are joining virtually as well. It's been a pleasure and, uh, to take part in this panel discussion today on harnessing state-federal decision-making and coordination in the United States and India. And uh, I have very, some eminent personalities on the dais, uh, which I have been associated with, you, with them and uh, have been a part of the teams which have been really working towards this uh, India-US joint collaborative framework on various parts and my focus of this po point today would be the renewable energy because I belong to the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and have been associated with the government of India for the last uh, close to three years uh, and also taking the responsibility of the international collaborations that the ministry works on. Ladies and gentlemen, we are as India, we are celebrating the 75 years of Indian independence. And uh, what a moment for all of us to be a part of this as we keep on celebrating India's achievements over what we achieved during the last 75 years and energy as such has been a very core point in our progressive uh, abilities to take forward uh, where India was and where India is and where India is going to be, not in 2030, not in 2047, but beyond that as well. So the cooperation in the field of renewable energy between India and US, the two strong democracies and very vibrant democracies has been remarkable and we all understand how these two democracies have led uh, to partnerships to, and as uh, the Deputy Secretary mentioned, it, the, the, the relationship between these two countries have been stronger and stronger and today as we speak, it has been grown into a very well, trade partnerships have increased uh, considerably. So as, just I will take some point, some minutes for you to explain where India is today. You know, out of a grid of 403 gigawatts, the total installed capacity, the total installed capacity that comes from non-fossil based sources is almost 167 gigawatts. So we are more than 41% of the total energy that is being installed in India today is, does come from non-fossil based sources. What we announced and what we have set a target for us as an interim target is by 2030, the Honorable Prime Minister raised it from what he had said earlier. So now we are aiming at around 500 gigawatt 
uh, from non-fossil based sources out of, out of the grid which we expect to be around close to 817 gigawatts by 2030. That means we are enhancing this 41% to close to more than 60% what will be in the next eight years down the line. And that is where the focus on wind, solar, bioenergy, waste to energy, hydrogen, hydro, everything is going to play a key role. And that's where the relationship between India and US take forward the knowledge, the experience that each country has in its, in its towards its climate goals, towards the sustainability that we call uh, taking forward. So what we, we have been working on a just and equitable energy transition, and uh, we believe that it has to be in the decentralized approach. What I mean decentralized is that, uh, like, in the India, like the, in the US, India too, States have played a very critical role, and some of my state uh, partners and colleagues are here. They will be able to explain how their decision making has led to this progressive renewable energy growth. But states are the ones who comes with ideas, states are the ones who implement ideas, and states are the ones who are closest to the consumer. And therefore, enabling this federal state relationship is critical to any decision making and any implementation, or any uh, decision that is implemented going forward. So electricity as India, uh, you are all aware that is a concurrent subject. So both the central and the state governments can make laws on the subject. And over the years, we have seen very good coordination between uh, the Indian uh, federal government and the state governments. And we have the states. In fact, you are just to state that India is blessed with enormous RE potential. But that RE potential also is concentrated on few states, with mostly the southwest uh, states where wind has been uh, phenomenally good so that it can be techno-commercially exploited and starting from the northern state of Rajasthan to the southern coast, southern uh, state of Tamil Nadu, uh, wind has been favorable, whereas solar is almost favorable across most of the states where the, uh, the energy can be uh, uh, exploited. So states have been making very uh, remarkable progress. Most of the states have set their ambitious targets and we also have a obligatory framework that we have evolved through the Electricity Act 2003, which also enables states to take decisions that will uh, be favorable to RE. So India has been promoting as well as advocating the idea of citizen-centric energy transition. Uh, my colleague will go and explain you how he has superheaded this uh, uh, citizen-centric energy transition ac activity, uh, which primarily drives the rooftops and the agriculture, uh, solarization of the agriculture and other aspects. Uh, and in fact, uh, we are taking this as a theme uh, going forward. Uh, we did it last year when we represented at the high level energy dialogue uh, at the United Nations, but we're also going forward to take this forward as we move into the G20 presidency next, next year and the CM uh, presidency as a CM uh, hosting CM as well during the next year. So several basic but very important enabling um, actions as I call, uh, where is the awareness, the publicity, the facilitation, the encouragement, and all these are uh, not possible without the active participation of subnational entities. And I'm pleased to inform this forum that Indian states and local bodies do play and are playing a very critical role in helping these renewable energy schemes and solutions reach the last mile user. So uh, the, uh, uh, the MOU between MOU between ARIAS and uh, uh, NASIO, as uh, we call, and uh, it has been a welcome step in this direction. There is immense scope as we go forward uh, to promote this uh, collaborative program. A possible initiative could also be to have a joint task force on large-scale solar deployment comprising of representatives from our states like California, Texas in the US, and states like Gujarat, Karnataka in India as well. So we, should all, we could also undertake joint scoping missions to identify mutual areas of interest and expertise and come with uh, the tangible deliverables, and that's what uh, we all are here to do. I would also look forward to proposals from both NASIO and RES on this front. Another possible step could be a SAGE-like initiative. And I think I, I uh, did mention, and uh, David also mentioned, the Deputy Secretary, on the US-India Strategic Clean Energy Partnership, which, was, uh, which has now turned into a uh, very, very intense and uh, 
uh, very valuable partnership when in April 2021 Leaders Climate Summit, both President Biden and President, uh, Prime Minister Modi announced a high-level US-India climate and clean energy agenda 2030 partnership. And Varun has been and been discussing with us on several activities that we could take because we also created a climate action and finance mobilization dialogue that is CFMD. And as we are speaking, there are some other presentations happening today uh, virtually on, on this uh, dialogue as well. So ladies and gentlemen, both India and US are committed to facilitate and accelerate global, global energy transition. What holds true for our countries will hold true for several other uh, transition nations. The models for cooperation between state governments and subnational entities we establish could be replicated uh, in other countries and regions and also but thereby strengthening the entire transition efforts. I am sure that the distinguished panelists from this forum today will provide us necessary insights as well as ideas for taking the Nazio RES cooperation forward, which could be important not just from the bilateral perspective, but also in the context of the global energy transition in the time to come. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And next, uh, let me invite Dr. Sivaram. You can stay here, or it's up to you if you want to. Seated. Okay, I, okay, I will hang out here. Um, well, well, it's it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you um, to to CSIS, to you, my, my friend Jane. I don't know if I see Rick out here, um, uh, but uh, you, you know, it's it's funny in in our line of work when we talk about India and subnational in the same sentence, the next word we typically say is CSIS. You've really made a, a name for yourselves in this space, and it's fantastic. Also, really want to thank um, my, my my friend and colleague. Um, uh, the, the Joint Secretary. It's been such a pleasure working with you on the U.S.-India Agenda 2030 partnership, um, and I look forward to hearing uh, your colleagues' remarks. Let me say just, just a few things from the U.S. government perspective. Um, I'll start by sharing a little bit of a broad overview of how Secretary John Kerry has thought about both last year's run to Glasgow and then this year's run to Sharm el-Sheikh, and then I'll dig into the purpose of this panel, which is subnational action. Um, th from the Secretary's point of view, and let me tell you, he is on the road probably more days than not. I, I don't know how many days he spent in DC because he has been engaged in tireless diplomacy with countries around the world ever since day one. In Glasgow, the big triumph was a large majority of the world by GDP came to Glasgow with nationally determined contributions, NDCs, in line with holding the Earth's temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And this year, we continue uh, to work with our partner countries. We are delighted to have been working with India for the last two years on climate ambition. We welcome their NDC. Um, and we welcome the goals that the Joint Secretary just mentioned, the 500 gigawatts of non-fossil capacity. It's a huge target, and the US is committed to help them achieve it. You heard from Deputy Secretary Turk about how many ways we partner with the Indian government. And the Climate Action and Finance Mobilization Dialogue that Secretary Kerry co-chairs with uh, uh, Minister Yadav in, the, in, in India, along with a range of Indian agencies, uh, has really been a success in helping us to frame the next set of steps for our collaboration. I think the U.S. is also very committed to India's global leadership on this subject. We joined the International Solar Alliance, the leadership uh, uh, for industry transition, both groups that India leads. We've been contributors and uh, participants in the India-led Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. So we are delighted that India stepped forward and put its leadership brand on global clean energy and climate-focused initiatives. We're also delighted that just two months ago, India became a steering board member of the First Movers Coalition, a set of countries and companies committed to decarbonizing the hardest to abate sectors across industry and long-distance transportation. So our cooperation is deep, and at the national level, we have a lot of existing channels that we talk about fairly often. But today's about the subnational level. And I'm just delighted we're talking about it. Look, from the United States point of view, we know that our own decarbonization journey has been driven through a mix of national and subnational policies. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, take the rise of utility scale solar and wind in this country. There were national level policies that played a critical role, the investment tax credit and production tax credit, DOE's loan programs office that supported the first five installations greater than 100 megawatts, but that's not the whole story. It's probably not even half the story. The other half of the story is what the states were doing. It was renewable portfolio standards in states like California that created the early demand so that those 100 megawatt utility scale installations could actually be built. And once that happened, 
in 2009, 10, 11, that's when there was a global utility scale solar boom. It was the federal and state governments under the Obama-Biden administration working hand in hand. And let me tell you, state policy is true across the political spectrum here in the United States. It was Texas that developed the, the CREZ transmission corridor that's led to a boom in wind energy, and now Texas is, is becoming a national leader in solar energy. So we know the importance of state policy. In the Indian context, it's just, if not more important, because as the Joint Secretary said, electricity, for example, is a concurrent subject. You can look across sectors. In the electricity side, for example, folks talk a lot about the high renewable penetration of a country like Germany that got out there early. You know who's got renewable penetration higher than Germany? Variable renewable energy penetration from intermittent sources like wind and solar. It's the state of Karnataka. Higher than Germany. Indian states are going to be on the forefront of managing the intermittency of a high renewables grid. It's going to be Indian states that manage the policies, for example, of the distribution sector. And it's Indian states that step forward, for example, like Gujarat, where they're able to get low cost of capital uh, to, to install renewable projects to serve those distribution com uh, companies. Elsewhere, it'll be Indian states that step forward on policies such as agricultural load shifting to make it possible to integrate renewables. You know, I used to work and live in India uh, in the renewable energy sector, and I recall that state-level policies were just so important, such as, for example, land acquisition in a state like Rajasthan. Now, we worked hand in, you know, very closely with, with the MNRE, which is just a critical agency, but also the states played a large role. Outside, of course, of power, there is also take industry. The different states differ in their industrial makeup. It'll be up to subnational policymakers to push forward the industrial agenda that works for that regional context. You can imagine green hydrogen-based steel clusters in the east or green hydrogen-based refineries in the west. Again, subnational policy will determine the shape of the energy transition based on local regional characteristics. And let me not leave out the cities. The cities will play a critical role as well, whether it's mass transit in the cities of Delhi or Bangalore, um, to policies to encourage electric vehicle charging or rooftop solar. So a range of subnational opportunities. I just want to close by saying we are committed not just to the national level partnership, but to the subnational as well. You may recall last year at the national level, we and the Indian government, the US Department of State and the Indian government, both jointly launched a report called the Flexible Resources Initiative. It showed that Prime Minister Modi's 500 gigawatt target is in fact the optimal least cost target if we are able to get substantial, I think 63 gigawatts of storage out on the system. It was a landmark study. It certified that the target, 500 gigawatts, is the right one and it's an ambitious one. But now we're taking the next step. My, my, uh, my office under Secretary Kerry is now going to support the next set of work working with our partners, the Department of Energy um, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to do sub-national sets of analyses to cascade the 500 gigawatt challenge down to the level of states and how we actually optimize electricity systems. And that's just the first step. We have a range of upcoming collaborations at the sub-national level and we'll work with our partners like CSIS. So I just want to say thank you for, for hosting this. We should be talking a lot more about sub-national action. It's so important. And thanks to my colleagues for joining. Thanks. Thank you so much, Vibram. And next, let me invite uh, Mr. David Terry with Nazio. And yes. Thank you. I wanted to share a little bit about uh, our organization, but more importantly, our state members around the country. And I think the uh, comments earlier, really building on those, the kind of innovation that we see at the state level um, is always heartening. It, it uh, breeds confidence, not complacence, but confidence um, that we can address climate, energy affordability, et cetera. Uh, NASIO represents the 56 state and territory energy offices around the country, including the District of Columbia. Our governor-designated uh, uh, members uh, work in almost every energy area, particularly in policy and programs looking forward in uh, various energy supply, uh, development, distribution, end-use areas, buildings efficiency, renewables, et cetera. 
And that broad perspective that they bring to an economy-wide uh, way to address energy, climate, security, affordability, is, I think, uh, what gives me the confidence about the state innovations that occur. You know, I was just uh, reminded of the early renewable electricity standards, and uh, actually it was Iowa with the first standard, and they often innovation comes from unusual places. Uh, Iowa has some 40% of their electricity generated from wind power now and other renewables in the state. It's a great example. We, in our work with NASIO, really to share the best practices across each of the states that they're doing in particular areas. We have the benefit of uh, really, as it's always been referred to, as the laboratories of democracy in the state. That's all tr also true in energy when it comes to energy policy, guiding energy markets. Um, it, it is uh, often challenging when I'm asked for, you know, what states are doing the best work on climate or energy. It's really uh, quite diverse. And uh, more recently, we've been learning uh, about the work of Wyoming, North Dakota, Louisiana, on carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Their governors in each of those cases of those states are committed to zero carbon goals in their economy over the medium and long term. Uh, big steps forward in areas that often aren't spoken about. In the renewable power area, we obviously have a huge amount of community solar, utility scale solar, um, and other uh, uh, renewable energy activities underway and investments. In uh, the building space, uh, we see decarbonization, major historic investments being made by California, Maine, and from New York, and other states you'll hear about later today. I don't want to steal the thunder of our other members. But there are some places where I think um, often we forget uh, about the importance of both uh, federal state cooperation and international cooperation. The innovation that the U.S. Department of Energy brings, their focus on research, is, informs the state's policy work and looking forward. We're building and modernizing the grid uh, for the next 50, 60, 70, 100 years, knowing the technologies that are coming down the pike, so to speak, in each of these areas, how they'll be integrated. That's something that our members are focused on almost universally. We have a confluence of digitization of the grid, of, uh, of distributed energy resources that have to be managed in new ways. The interaction of the grid with buildings, the interaction of the grid with vehicle electrification. We see in the Northeast and in the Midwest and the West, greater electrification of the thermal load for buildings. All of these pieces of the grid are asking things of our utilities, of our grid managers, and of cities um, and communities that we live in to manage their power differently. Our, our policy is uh, looking ahead to that. Our regulatory activities obviously need to uh, keep pace with that. That is a difficult thing to do. It's generally not happening, but we're working on it. I think the other thing I wanted to, to really hit home on, NASIO was very engaged with a number of energy offices about a decade ago in international exchange. And we learned a great deal from our partners. The work we've been doing uh, with areas and CSIS is, uh, is really emblematic of this. I'm very, really uh, heartened by the amount of shared interest that we have across these technology areas. Deputy Secretary Turk noted some of those, and there are certainly many others. But I think the, the challenge we face is not only uh, the innovation piece, but in the manufacturing and deployment um, in our respective countries, the trade that can be developed, um, and really the solution sets we bring uh, to our communities. This is the other place where I think our energy office members around the country really excel. Partnerships with their local governments, large cities certainly, but the many thousands and thousands of small communities of 300 uh, residents and a few thousand residents and 20,000 residents that don't have energy policy experts or climate experts on staff. Our energy offices are often working with them, trying to bring innovative models that we try to share um, from one state to another, one city to another, and it is a, very, a really successful partnership. Uh, lastly, I wanted to touch on the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Investment and in Jobs Act uh, that was talked about by Deputy Secretary Turk earlier. There were so many exciting, innovative things going on across the country um, in almost every state before the uh, uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill passed. This bill really allows a historic opportunity to accelerate that, to fund it. Um, it is getting off to a start. The money will flow over the next five years. And I think it's another piece of the puzzle as we share what we learn as the states deploy those technologies in the grid, in buildings, in solar power, in hydrogen, et cetera. Um, we'll have more, I think, to share with our experiences and learn from all of you um, and learn from our Indian counterparts. But I will pause there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. Last but not least, Mr. Jethani, please. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank CSIS for uh, organizing this event. 
and uh, they have played a key key role uh, in uh, having this uh, partnership with the nasio we signed this mou uh, on 15th of july last year where our honorable minister of uh, states mr bhagwant kuba and uh, secretary grand home was there so it was uh, through online but now I, i could meet all these colleagues from the nasio here and uh, uh, some of my colleagues who in the states are also present because of this cooperation with the nasio so thanks to uh, cis for this all these things so as uh, mr jigdale and mr varun has said that the state has to play a key key role when uh, we are implementing the targets of the national targets like like 500 gigawatt we have planned for 2030 of course we have already achieved the, our ndcs that has been declared in 2015 for the 40% of the uh, electricity coming from the non fossil so uh, that is one uh, states like uh, the gujarat say suppose the gujarat they have done a very well in uh, rooftop solar during the last two years they could achieve more than 1200 uh, megawatts of uh, rooftop in the residential sector even uh, because the covid pandemic was there so around 3 lakh household could install a rooftop that is because of the national uh, states policy states initiative similarly in the state of karnataka they could achieve the rpo the renewable purchase obligation up to 50% so there are states which have the rpo achievement maybe 2% 3% and the on the country there are states they have achieved the rpo of 50% so 50% power is coming from the renewables so a state's policy is uh, playing a key role when we are going to achieve the national targets uh, similarly for the village electrification of course we have achieved the village 100% electrification in 2018 itself household electrification under the our sobhagya scheme uh, during the 2020 we said that all the household they are willing to get the electricity they have been electrified uh, but now we are going to have uh, uh, the living standards of our countrymen is going high La uh, during this year uh, around 6 million air condition were sold so you can see that our energy demand is going to increase of course uh, our per capita electricity consumption is around 1200 units a uh, year but uh, uh, this is uh, around uh, one third of that uh, world average and and we have to increase our demand is increasing that demand has to be met 500 gigawatt up to 2030 is not a big target i think we can achieve even uh, just take a example of the uh, agriculture sector or you said we have around 211 billion units consumption in a year from the agriculture sector it's around 18 to 20% of the total energy consumption if this load can be shifted to the solar around 120 gigawatt solar power would be required so this can be done very easily in the decentralized mode we have the policy for the rooftop the kusum kusum we have uh, to uh, solarize around uh, 3.5 million agriculture pumps we have uh, uh, 30 million billion uh, 30 million uh, pumps in the country so if we take a uh, target of solarizing all the pumps of course uh, more than 150 gigawatt could be achieved through the solar and uh, when we are going to have the solarization of all the pumps then we have to think of the storage also because the agriculture is uh, not uh, distributed to all the consumption is not distributed all over the uh, year it is a uh, seasonal so for the seasonal consumption then you have to have some kind of storage for rooftop also say in the state of gujarat they have achieved a higher uh, rooftop uh, penetration but uh, now they are facing some kind of issues related to the going the voltage is going higher or they have to augment the transformer capacity at the distribution level so for that if the storage is there they need not to have the augmentation of the distribution transformer so some of the innovative technologies has to be uh, there and for this i think uh, the partnership between the nasio and uh, areas could uh, be very helpful and we can understand more from uh, the partnership between the us and that that's all i have to say thank you thank you so much mr jathani
Now, let me um, actually start the bit of a moderated discussion here. I have some uh, questions that I've been really uh, wanting to ask these leaders from both the national and state levels. But first, let me focus on more of a national level uh, issues, if I may. Um, you know, uh, the United States and India share a lot of attributes, you know, being large democratic countries and et cetera. But one of the, I guess, sort of unfortunate thing, uh, things that we share is that we're both fairly large or significant uh, emitters of greenhouse gases. But the good news is that we're both committed to doing something about it. We have very you know, ambitious or, or very uh, strong uh, commitments to address the emissions. And uh, Deputy Secretary um, Turk has already highlighted some of the technologies that the both countries are prioritizing. But I wanted to hear from you a little more about some of the tools, national level policies and, and tools that you know, the respective governments are trying to sort of uh, look to to sort of advance our clean energy and climate action commitments. Uh, maybe we start with the Joint Secretary, please. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think I will take uh, from where uh, Mr. Jethani just mentioned. Uh, the fact today between the two countries is that if you look at India, we are growing. Our per capita, the electricity consumption per capita is what Jithani Jid mentioned is around 1.2 megawatt hour on a yearly basis, which is extremely low. And therefore, our demand is going to grow rapidly, which we have seen out of uh, what happened post-COVID during the last year is the demand has increased almost 15% uh, in this few months period. Now, vis is what we have been looking at on the CO2 emission space, I think that data, if you really look at what India has contributed, the India's per capita emission on a CO2 emission uh, is one third of the global average. So there are two important aspects as we speak. One, we have to ensure that the demand is met. Second, we have to also ensure that we don't emit greenhouse gases. Now this is, uh, this is a a problem that has to be resolved in such a way that the consumer doesn't deprive of the energy that he wants to for his growth. And therefore, if we look at what we have been trying to achieve over the last seven, eight years and going forward in the next eight years is to rapidly accelerate the deployment of renewable energy. If you look at where were we in 2015, we had a 75 gigawatt of total capacity, including large hydro. What are we today? We are and almost reaching 170. So we, the pace at which we are growing is phenomenal. The pace at which we want to grow is further phenomenal because we have to reach 500 gigawatts. Now what we have done is an experience that we have gained is, is on our side because we have achieved that growth. But going forward at a no, we were at 75, reaching 150 is easier, but we are at 150, reaching 500 becomes a little more difficult. But then there are three key aspects, as I mentioned, that India wants to look at. One is obviously the plain vanilla wind solar will continue as it grows. But we want to bring in the new technology or the new area of investments is the offshore wind. We also have a large coastline, 7,600 kilometers of large coastline, good potential. What we need is the right technology that should come to India. The supply chain resilience that should occur in all kinds of technologies, include offshore wind. And therefore, offshore wind is one of those aspects. Second aspect is obviously energy transition from fossil to non-fossil will not be possible until you deploy or make available a good storage solutions. So therefore, battery storage or any other pumped hydro storage or any other storage that come, will come up in the next 8, 10 years uh, will be hard, welcomed by the uh, Indian entities. We are focusing on large scale uh, solar battery storages. We already issued uh, the first tender, which is uh, maybe uh, the largest in the world today, which is around 1,000 megawatt hour battery storage. That's under discussions, and I invite all those uh, uh, entities and investors from uh, US to India to participate in these. And the third, which the Deputy Secretary did mention, is the National Green Hydrogen Mission. 
Now, green hydrogen is going to play a very critical role in decarbonizing the other aspect. The, because if you look at the Indian scenario, the, out of the total 100% energy that is consumed, 18% comes from electricity as of now. While we are making our efforts to electrify the economy and green the grid, because these two fundamental mantras is what we are looking. First is electrify the economy as, as, fast, as fast and as far as possible, and then green the grid. So with this, maybe we... 2030, we go slightly more than 18%, but obviously the decarbonization of the other sectors will only come through the green feedstocks and uh, raw material that is green hydrogen. So working on that, and in these three roles, I think our partnerships between India and US, whether it's solar task force, whether it's hydrogen task force, the, the, the green energy partnership, the renewable energy pillars, everything is going to play a critical role, and every unit of electricity Whichever technology, renewable energy technology will come, we will be welcoming it. Thank you. Um, if I may just quickly follow up, I, I think I've been quite struck by how uh, robust you know, some of uh, um, India's clean energy uh, deployment uh, efforts are, and then including hydrogen. Um, and, um, but looking at, I guess, the supply side tools, I think there's like tax and, and uh, incentives and et cetera. Uh, what are some of the, if I may, like uh, demand side sort of a policy tools that you're looking to use? On the hydrogen? Um, no, just any of these key. Uh, as right. You, yes. So the, the, the one is the demand as we see, uh, you know, uh, has continues to rise as the per capita electricity consumption is much more lower. So the and the citizens are now powered or empowered uh, with uh, critical tools to uh, the, the, the purchase powering parity has increased, the, the ability to uh, procure and make their livelihoods more stronger has increased. So that is one way of increasing the demand. But on the other side, there are several interventions that the government of India, in, in collaboration with the state governments and the regulator has been making, is to introduce, has been introducing, as now there is an effort to make it enforceable, is the renewable power purchase obligations. So that means every distribution company, or I, I should say an obligated entity, which is either in the, power, in the supply chain of power, or is generating power, or consuming power, needs to have a certain element of renewable energy mix into his uh, into his entire total electricity mix and uh, we we have defined certain trajectories and from now onwards till 2030 we are coming with a new trajectory uh, which will take which will classify wind which will classify hydropower which will also classify the others which include solar and other re technology so we'll specify a category which include which i presume from now onwards till 2030 will go up to almost 43 44 percent of the total electricity that an obligated entity needs to come from renewables uh, so that is an uh, that is an uh, way of um, may bringing in demand side uh, interventions but on the hydrogen side what we are looking at to, to come initially uh, is to ensure that those low-hanging fruits, which we believe is the refinery and the fertilizer sector, there we are trying to put up some mandates for those companies to actually blend the green hydrogen into their overall hydrogen mix so that the demand starts rising. And as soon as the technologies, uh, with the effort of all the international collaboration that we are talking about, uh, Deputy Secretary mentioned of $1 by this in one decade, I think as we reach towards that goal, uh, green hydrogen will, on its own, be a very acceptable commodity as we move forward. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, I'll turn to you, Farron. Let me just focus in on, a, on an aspect of your question, an aspect of how both India and the United States can have extraordinary impact is where we focus not just on decarbonizing our own economies, but doing it in a way that has extra national impact, setting a demonstration or an example for the rest of the world. And I think we do it in similar ways and different ways. Um, I think both of us are clearly investing in the next generation of technologies that can be used not just in our own borders, but all over the world. And second, in India's case in particular, India's already head and shoulders the leading emerging economy on the clean energy transition. In fact, you know, India is on any given year maybe a top three global renewable energy market, ahead of many most advanced economies, frankly. Um, what India can do now in this next phase of going from the initial uh, stages of building out renewable energy to building super high penetration variable renewable systems or moving to industry and transportation decarbonization, that sets an example for the rest of emerging economies. I'll, I'll tell you bluntly, 
when we go and you know I, I have been with the secretary to several emerging economies around the world the India playbook is one that we often bring out and we say look this is how India did it and and, and there's no reason why you you know in, insert country name here can't get started on that same path let me just go back to the the first thing which was which was technology um, you heard from Deputy Secretary Turk about the extraordinary technology investments that the U.S. is making. Again, that will our innovation ambition raises the world's climate ambition. Um, our loan programs office, for example, has these innovative loan guarantees out to technologies such as hydrogen out in Utah, where you could see you know the world's largest uh, hydrogen facility come up and demonstrate to the rest of the world that hey, you can do it at the scale. You can store it in salt caverns. You can regenerate electricity, etc. You can use it for industrial purposes. Um, beyond that, um, you mentioned the demand side. There are both public and private initiatives underway, both spearheaded by the United States or by our subnational U.S. state governments that are creating demand for these technologies. You see, for example, RFPs around the United States for long-duration energy storage, a key need both for India and the United States. Um, Minnesota, for example, had a, an, an RFP for long-duration storage. Uh, many states have done this. That's creating demand for a technology that then, if it meets the performance standards, can create an early market specifically for that technology. We're doing this with the private sector as well. President Biden and Secretary Kerry launched the First Movers Coalition. This is a set of 55 companies, some of the world's biggest companies, more than 10% of the Fortune Global 2000 by market cap. And these companies have all made early market commitments designed in con consultation with the US government and the World Economic Forum in order to create these early markets for new technologies clean steel, near-zero aluminum, clean shipping, trucking, aviation, carbon dioxide removal technologies. All of these are sectors where new technologies need to break in if we have any hope of even starting the energy transition. We've started the energy transition in power. We haven't started it in industry or long-distance transport. And so the First Movers Coalition, just like uh, we created early demand signals for vaccines, we're creating early demand signals for the next generation of energy technologies. Those are ways in which uh, the United States, India, and our partners in the private sector can have impact well beyond our borders. Because if we bring technologies to tipping points, suddenly, whether you're in steel or you're in long distance trucking, suddenly it becomes much cheaper and more politically palatable to decarbonize. Whereas today, there are not commercially available solutions in these sectors. We need to create them and bring them to scale. Thank you so much, Mavrun. Um, let me then uh, turn to more of a state level uh, discussions, if I may. So in some of the US states, um, I think climate, the, you know, the crisis is really driving you know, clean energy policy making. But in, in some other states within the United States, that's not, you know, that's not the primary factor. So I, I wanted to invite um, you know, David to sort of tell the audience a little more about what are some of the factors uh, you know, that are driving clean energy policy making at state levels within the United States? And then, and then also uh, invite Mr. Jathani to add a sort of an Indian perspective. What are some of the factors that are driving uh, state level uh, investment or commitment to clean energy uh, issues? You know, um, there are you know, jobs and all these different issues, but what are some of the, the top factors? It, it's an interesting question, and I, we, we have a, a, a phrase among state uh, energy policy circles, and state circles generally, if you uh, understand one state, you understand one state. The motivations differ greatly. Um, but I think uh, one of the, the misnomers that we often run into is, I would say the vast majority of states um, are in part driven by climate. It's not a, it's not a several or, or, or half, it's really the majority. And and if you look at the examples I gave earlier, some of the producing fossil fuel producing states that have made those commitments and are acting in, through investment. I, I think the secondary motivation is often economic development. When you think of uh, our members in particular, they're often responding to uh, state governors and legislatures who uh, rightly are focused on life, health, safety, uh, their economy, and jobs. And so the economic factor is enormous. We've seen that impact as uh, companies large and small have uh, demanded or requested renewable power, certainly consumers as well. That's driven renewables investment. It's driven renewable uh, portfolio standards, frankly. 
it's driving a lot of the electrification issues as well. Uh, the energy offices were engaged in transportation alternative fuels going back to the uh, oil crisis of the 70s. And they've been working on the electric aspect of vehicles for well over a decade, before Tesla was Tesla. Um, and, and I think one of the motivations there is also opening markets, new opportunities for uh, local companies, whether that's uh, General Motors if you're in Michigan, uh, or a small supply chain company uh, in another state on energy storage, et cetera. So those economic drivers are huge, and they have the dual benefits. Most consumers in most states are concerned about the environment, concerned about climate, and if they can bring the jobs with that, it's huge. The other maybe unfortunate driver is resilience. We have, uh, at this point, as is well known, we have wildfires, hurricanes, flooding, et cetera, uh, that are frequent and intense. And in most states, not all, but in most states, they're facing that resilience question. They see renewables as a part of that, community-based renewables. They see building codes, building energy codes as a part of that. Uh, those all come together. I think the other driver, which is uh, maybe more of a challenge, but it comes up in every conversation. We just finished six uh, meetings across the country with all the regions uh, that make up NASIO and workforce and training. It isn't just a creation of jobs, but uh, high paying jobs certainly, but training the workforce to make all of this happen. And I think those all come together in clean energy in a unique way and in the energy sector in general. And um, lastly, I think there is an understanding. One of the things that I think most of our members agree upon is that state, federal, private sector partnership. It is the private sector investment that is going to make this work. It's going to make us reach the climate goals, the affordability goals, et cetera. And I think that that really belief in that driver is part of what underpins the collaborative nature of our members that uh, tend to, um, as much diversity as there is among the states, tend to agree on these topics. I'm glad that you actually brought up the more of the community level uh, issues too, because I think at a lot of state and then probably city, you know, at the local levels, really the, the you know the needs of the communities and then also needs of local businesses. I mean, these are extremely important drivers. And then yeah, you know, that's uh, I'm glad. No, thank you. That was fantastic. And let me um, invite uh, Mr. Jathani to add sort of Indian perspective to this. Uh, so as Mr. Jagdali has said that uh, the states in India having the uh, renewable potential, uh, different level of potential, like uh, the wind potential, that is concentrated into the seven to eight states. And similarly, uh, the solar, of course, solar is all available all over the country, but uh, due to, say, uh, geographical situation, the radiation is not equal. Also, the land availability is also an uh, issue. So, uh, say, state of Rajasthan having a uh, good land availability. Gujarat, they have the good uh, land potential available. So these states, these two states, or the state of Tamil Nadu where the wind potential is good, they have to make conducive policy for the investment to come in. The, uh, if, suppose they, they are giving the, as Ms. Varun said, the land equation. So you have the policy that are facilitating the land acquisition, easy process. You are not uh, 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 charging any additional fees or something like that. So that the private investor will come. And the, as a part of the government of India, the government of India has given the ISTS waiver. The, so your power can be transmitted free of, from uh, the, any part of the country to any other uh, part of the country. So suppose like the state of Assam. They don't have the land. They, their solar radiation is also low. So if they install a solar, they, will, they have to invest more. Whereas they can uh, buy the power from the uh, states of like Rajasthan, Gujarat, where we are now getting the uh, rate of solar is just uh, two rupees 50 pesa or like that. So if they produce the power in their own state, it may be around four rupees or so. So why to pay 50% more when they can get power from uh, these states? But of course, these states have to have conducive policies for the private investor to put in uh, their money. They can uh, inst install the solar or wind power like that. Uh, on uh, the other uh, situations like for the state like uh, the northeastern states where, of course, you cannot have these uh, solar power installed, but they, uh, the people in the village, they need uh, their uh, energy access needs. For that, we are now promoting the decentralized renewable energy. So wherein uh, the small, small uh, uh, applications, livelihood applications like the solar uh, cold storage, solar uh, spinning mills, or solar dryers, 
So they can uh, uh, produce their agriculture and then they can use the, these uh, applications to store and uh, get it f uh, processed so that they can sell it to the market. Similarly, uh, for uh, the uh, e-mobility also, we are going giving them some kind of uh, solar charging stations or like that. So that will help in growing their uh, uh, livelihood levels. With that, the economy will also grow in that these levels. On community solar, we are also working on uh, uh, regulations like virtual net metering. So in the virtual net metering, uh, in the villages, they, the villagers are not having this, uh, the roof that is not strong enough to hold the uh, solar panels. So instead of having a solar panels on individual households, they can uh, uh, aggregate the demand and then they can put a solar on one place, and even then they can get the benefit of the net metering. So such a kind of regulations are being uh, formulated in the state. Some of the states already have seen these regulations, and we are requesting all the states to come in. And, and I think we are going to have the community solars that will help in the uh, villages. In the panchayats, we have the small uh, in governing body of the village is the panchayat in the uh, uh, India. So these panchas can be the self-sustainable. And uh, with that, we can further grow uh, the economy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's, I think there's so much that, the, you know, because of the collaboration, not in spite, and then also because of the, having this federal you know, system, both national level leadership and, and action, and also state level, I think there's so much that we, we are doing, we will be doing, and, but then also the synergy that I, all four of you have highlighted is just remarkable, and it's really, truly exciting. Um, I think the time is uh, up, so let me actually, so let me just, you know, uh, invite the audience to thank this fantastic speakers, panelists, you know, thank you so much for traveling all the way from India and to, you know, right down the street, but in and, 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 uh, various parts of the, the United States, but uh, please join me in thanking this excellent panel. Now, I'd like to invite Sandy uh, Fazeli. Uh, she's the um, Senior Managing Director of Anasio. She's going to uh, stay, stay uh, put. Um, she's going to come up to the stage, um, and she is going to lead the discussion of the next panel. That's going to be on the state clean energy leadership. So more exciting conversation to come. for that terrific panel, uh, really interesting and rich uh, information. Mr. Swine, you're welcome to join. So next. Oh, okay, should I pause then? Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do a quick break and then uh, just two minutes and then get started. Go right ahead because we're joined by some colleagues on the video as well uh, from India. My name is Sandy Fazeli. I'm with the National Association of State Energy Officials, or NASIO. Um, we had a really excellent panel just now highlighting state and federal co collaboration, but next we'll be highlighting state successes both in the US and India. Um, I'm very excited to be leading this, this effort um, and also to elevate some of the work that NASIO's members here in the United States are doing as well as um, India's amazing subnational leaders as well. Um, so we're joined um, uh, by two colleagues on, on video and then four of us here, um, or five of us here on stage. Um, Mr. Sanjay Dubey, Principal Secretary of Energy for the Government of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, Mr. Niraj Verma, uh, Principal Secretary of Power for the Government of Assam. Uh, here with us, uh, Mr. Swine, Director of Gridco for the Government of Odisha. Um, Joanna Troy, Director of Energy Policy and Planning for the um, Government of Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources. 
Robert Jackson, Director of the Energy Office for the Michigan Department of en Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, and Ari Gerstman, Associate Director for the District of Columbia Department of Energy and Environment right here uh, in DC. Um, so we'll have each of our panelists share a few opening remarks about who they are and what their key priorities are, um, and then we'll have a, a discussion. And if you'd like to ask questions, feel free to do so. We have a microphone in the back, and just get my attention, and we'll we'll make this a little more interactive. Um, so I'd like to start by inviting uh, Mr. Dubey, uh, Principal Secretary of Energy for Madhya Pradesh, to share a few opening remarks. Sorry, Mr. Dubey, we can't hear you. Uh, you might need to unmute. Myself, uh, I hope now Perfect. I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you now. Thanks. OK. Thank you, Sandy, for inviting me. And I am, uh, I have, uh, uh, I'm feeling sorry that I could not be physically present uh, in uh, the good environments of uh, Washington, DC. But I'll try to uh, make do and uh, will uh, like to seize on any opportunity in future. <clears throat> To keep you and give you a perspective of what uh, Madhya Pradesh is all about, it is uh, a state in a uh, country of uh, India. It is uh, centrally located, surrounded by seven other states. So it doesn't have a coastal line and it is a land of state as such. It has an uh, area of about 300,000 square kilometer with a population of about 75 million people. If you talk about the consumer base uh, for the electricity consumption and for the connected loads, uh, we have about uh, 19 uh, million people, uh, consumers who are being given this electricity and they include industry, they include high tension, they include the low tension consumers also. We have an installed capacity of about 20, 22,000 megawatts and out of which about 25% is through the renewable energy sources. So as far as the installed capacity is concerned, we are about 25%. But in terms of energy, we are uh, supplying energy to the level of about 10 to 12% in a year. We have been serving uh, the renewable energy through the rooftop solar, uh, through uh, wind and solar parks. Uh, we are also come up uh, with a floating solar, which is going to be the world's largest floating solar of 600 megawatt uh, in one of our water bodies. Uh, our capacities, if in terms, uh, if you talk about in terms of how we have uh, fared in the last decade, then our uh, renewable energy capacity uh, in the previous decade was just about 2% of the total energy installed uh, capacity that we have in the state, which has gone up to up to 25%. So we have moved uh, very strongly in the direction of uh, involving the renewable energy. And as our Honorable Prime Minister has given us the target uh, in COP26 that we should be having at least 50% of energy uh, through the renewable energy sources by 2030 and uh, maybe net zero by 2070. Now, given this kind of a target and uh, the progress that we are supposed to make as a state, we are going strength to strength and Madhya Pradesh, though uh, in terms of renewable energy is not as, uh, um, I would say, happily placed because we don't have uh, coastal uh, lines and because of which we don't have offshore wind availability. We are not also as uh, good in terms of uh, location as Gujarat or uh, Rajasthan states are in terms of uh, solar insulation, yet, yet Madhya Pradesh has done some tremendous amount of good work which has attracted investment, which has attracted technology, which has attracted uh, uh, and shown our capabilities. To give you an example, we have been able to design our contract in such a way that uh, the lowest tariff received ever in any of the contracts in whole country has always been with the Madhya Pradesh. So we have as low as 0.25 cents per unit of uh, US dollars uh, as an energy that we are getting it through the solar parks. We also have been able to use the technology of one grid and one nation. And uh, my previous, in the previous session, when I was listening to the previous speaker, uh, we have been telling that the government of India has waived ISTS connectivity charges. So the wheeling charges have been wa waived off. It's only the losses that are there. And taking the advantage of that, the solar power getting generated in Madhya Pradesh is right now servicing Delhi Metro. It is servicing Indian Railways, one of the biggest uh, PSUs using the transportation facility. 
So that is the kind of capabilities that we have developed within the state with the help of the government of India. If we talk about finances, uh, there has been a lot of uh, private investment and I'm happy to share that uh, the investments are not coming from within the state, within the country, but it is from abroad. Multiple nations are now bidding and setting their shop in Madhya Pradesh in helping us in achieving our renewable energy target. In terms of finances, we have also been supported very nicely by uh, World Bank, by ADB, by KFW, and we have been able to access to the clean technology funds, which are available at a very concessional rate. Our capabilities are such that now we are targeting to build 600 megawatt of a floating solar. We have the country's first PSP in Sardar Sarovar. We are building the third PSP, uh, pumped hydro storage plant, to give that kind of a flexibility for our uh, taking care of uh, the renewable energy sources. And given this kind of a scenario, given the kind of progress, now the challenges come up and the challenges being associated with the renewable energy is the intermittency and the variability. And coupled with Madhya Pradesh, there is a lot of seasonal variation within the dem uh, demand pattern of it. Because of the agrarian economy, there is a huge variation that happens between one season to another in terms of a agricultural uh, demand pattern. So we have three challenges to uh, meet. One is how do we take care of the intermittency? How do we take care of the variability? And how do we take care of the seasonal variability. I would be happy to share this, that uh, uh, looking at the variability and the intermittency, uh, and because the agriculture makes a very big part of our requirement during the winter months, we have tied up with the MIT, and thanks to CSIS on that, uh, we are doing a research work with the MIT to forecast the demand for agricultural uh, requirement. We have also tied up with the IIT Delhi, one of the premier institutions of government of India, whereby we have been able to do uh, uh, the, the create a relationship in which we can use the distributed energy resources to service our agricultural feedback. And we have also been able to deploy AIML techniques for uh, demand forecasting and trying to match the supply side and the demand side based on the solar hours. So given these kind of technologies, the challenges that we have faced, we have been able to take care of them partially. And in future, the solutions that we have thought of is one, definitely the storage solutions that we have to work on. As I've already told, we are going for a pumped hydro and we are looking forward to the bid that has been floated by the government of India. And also we are ready with our state specific bid for a battery storage. So there is a huge demand. It takes care of our DSM charges. It takes care of a variability in the renewable energy sources. We are also looking at repurposing of our thermal power stations with the help of World Bank. We are working on it. So all those thermal power stations, which are now being um, this decommissioned, are now being converted into uh, repurposed uh, therm uh, generating stations. We will be taking care of the reactive power, et cetera. We are also looking at renewable energy on a round the clock basis, which means solar plus wind plus storage solutions. So we are open to such kind of a solution, the technical, technological interventions, which can possibly serve and service the challenges that are thrown by. So these are in all uh, the efforts that are being made by the state of uh, Madhya Pradesh. We are grateful that the government of India has been supporting the endeavors that the state government is uh, undertaking. We are being supported by clean, uh, sorry, uh, the um, finance uh, arrangements by the government of India. We are also being uh, supported by the international agencies and uh, the organizations like CSIS and uh, NASIO. Uh, we are will be very happy that uh, if they have anything um, of any information to be shared or uh, any technological interventions to be done, we'll be very happy to welcome them. That's all from my side and I'll be open for any questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Mr. Dubey. Very interesting, and we'll pick up on some of the, the items that you mentioned uh, during the discussion. Uh, next up, Mr. Verma, please, please go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Verma, I think you might be on mute or... Uh, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandy, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Neeraj Verma, I'm from uh, Assam. It is in the northeast of this country, and it doesn't have uh, any coastal area. It is surrounded by six other states. Uh, and uh, unlike Madhya Pradesh, Assam is 
not one of the leaders, but Assam is trying hard to improve its performance in renewable energy. So if I talk about uh, the state a little bit, it has got a population of 32 million and uh, per capita of Assam uh, GDP is around 25% less than national per capita. Uh, the availability of power in Assam is also uh, less than 50% compared to national average. Uh, we have largely uh, domestic consumers and our uh, power requirement is 2400 megawatt out of which till very recently we were producing less than 10 per 10% in renewable energy. Uh, in this regard, uh, there has been some good progress. In, uh, we had just completed uh, two big projects, uh, which has taken our renewable energy percentage to 20%. We have also come out with a solar policy uh, with the help of which uh, we are hopeful that uh, we will be able to generate some 2000 gigawatt of solar power. We don't have uh, opportunities in wind and any other renewable energy. But in solar power, uh, we have a uh, good potential. We are providing land and we have also got water bodies, which is in large number. So we are hopeful for uh, floating solar in, uh, in Assam. Uh, overall, in, by 25, 2025, we will have uh, 4,500 megawatt of demand. And uh, our uh, aim is to get 50% uh, of that from renewable energy. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's an ambitious uh, target. But I'm sure that uh, government has come forward with, uh, forward with various uh, policies. Uh, our rate uh, would be a little higher compared to what uh, Madhya Pradesh is getting or Rajasthan is getting. But if we look at the other options available to us, it is still cheaper. And uh, I think that uh, uh, it makes a good economic sense to have uh, some uh, uh, generation with uh, the state because uh, we don't have potential for uh, thermal generation. We don't have a potential for gas generation also. Earlier we had, but now that is also not there. So with this and uh, Assam is surrounded by our natural Pradesh, uh, which has come up with uh, various uh, mega hydro projects. So that can act as a uh, hedging for, you know, this uh, uh, variability to reduce the variability. And I'm sure that uh, in coming few years, Assam will be able to uh, achieve the target of 50% of uh, uh, energy requirement through renewable energy. That's all I have to say for the timing. And if there is any further question, I can reply. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next, we'll turn it to our colleagues in the room here. Uh, Mr. Swine, Director of Gridco at the Government of Odisha, please, please go ahead. Uh, very good morning uh, to the US audience and very good evening to my Indian audience. Uh, outside, I can. I thank CS for organizing and inventing our subnational level leadership in the clean energy. Uh, just to introduce, uh, I belong to Odisha uh, State Power Sector. And uh, to introduce Odisha State, uh, uh, it is a East Coast state uh, in the Eastern region. And we face uh, several uh, challenges in the state, uh, having uh, nine a million consumers, uh, 8 gigawatt install capacity, and 21,000 uh, giga unit of energy demand. And uh, the state uh, we have uh, uh, coinciding with the national level uh, target uh, fixed by Indian government, uh, uh, Jan Secretary already mentioned. So in that, uh, the state of Odisha play also major role. Um, there are, it is the eighth largest industrial GDP and 11th uh, most populous state. And uh, there are a large number of steel and uh, aluminum industries in the state. And the, being a mineral rich in the iron and coal and bauxite, there is a complexity in the state uh, to move ahead in the clean energy. And uh, uh, there are challenges also. I'll uh, point out a few initiatives what the state of Odisha has taken and where uh, the subnational level that may be possibility of collaboration, the similarity of US states uh, also may be there. And at present, we have the energy mix of uh, about 51% uh, from the coal because we are the coal rich uh, state. 49% capacity is from non-fossil fuel. I include the 
uh, hydro uh, capacity here in India, the renewable energy is including only 25 megawatt of uh, hydro power uh, capacities, and beyond that, it is a hydro separate uh, mega powers uh, are there. <laughs> So at present also the consumption, we have 54% of power consumed from the coal-based thermal power. Uh, balance 46% we are uh, taking uh, from the non-fossil fuel. So in that way at the present situation, we are ahead in, in, in clean energy, but we have a target to, in coinciding with the uh, union government to move ahead. And we are keeping a, a target to reach 50% in a couple of years of uh, non-fossil fuel. Uh, power consumption. There are tremendous uh, potential, although theoretical capacity has been uh, taken in Odisha. The solar, uh, there's a potential of 25 gigawatt, floating solar 3 gigawatt, and we have large uh, hydro possibility of 5 gigawatt, and wind potential of 8 uh, gigawatt in the state. Uh, besides the pond storage capacity, we are now exploring and uh, about 1.5 gigawatt of power uh, pump storage plants are in, in study now. So uh, uh, we have few challenges uh, in the state because having the largest fossil fuel available in the state, the, the cost of general production of the thermal power are cheap and the uh, steel and heavy industries, they are dependent on the reliable power and they, they are having the CGP in the state. In, in our state grid consumption, uh, almost uh, two times of the state uh, consumption is taken by the uh, state uh, CGP. They own gen, uh, generate the power through coal and consume. So to convert those to clean energy is a big challenge for the state uh, for the two reasons. One is uh, they are having the reliable uh, own generation and second is the economics, uh, the cost of power in the, uh, for them. So both has to be made uh, uh, possible for them to uh, go for the clean energy. That is the two third of the consumption of the state with the, uh, this uh, heavy industries. For that, we are making some policy interventions. As well as also, we are looking at how the affordable rate, the power will be available, clean energy power will be available. Uh, as the state uh, of Odisha, it, uh, we started the private partnership with the first state in the country to have the reform in the power sector and private participation in the distribution. We have the private players, uh, joint venture PPPs in the state in the distribution, and they are taking initiative on the consumer level uh, initiative, how the RE power is, uh, demand can grow. And the policy in, uh, in the regulatory front, the state commission has uh, now declared green tariff so that the consumers who are interested for the clean energy, they can buy the green uh, in the green tariff. It is marginally higher than the normal tariff in the, for the domestic as well as the commercial use. So there is also potential, and the state is low as far as the RE is concerned because of the low CUF of the, uh, the solar, and uh, the state of Odisha is often faced by the severe cyclones in once or twice in a year. So the, when it hits the East Coast, uh, mostly Odisha uh, affected. So on the RE front, those installation has to be uh, disaster resilient and uh, like uh, offshore wind or maybe the tidal power, those are facing challenges. Uh, the possibility is less for that region. And in, the, in case of solar also, the solar installation has to be on the disaster resilient uh, installations. And uh, a few initiatives we have already initiated in the clean energy. Uh, in collaboration with GIZ, we are making state energy action plan for uh, uh, moving ahead up to plan 2040. In that, we are uh, now planning, including the 20 department of the state, including commerce and transport, industry, uh, mass education, health, all the departments who are now uh, having a action plan, department-wise and the state level so that the clean energy uh, target will be made for 2040. And for this, we are engaging with the help of uh, uh, Price Order Coopers and E and Y, they're working on the state, how each department will take steps, each department will have their own target to come to a zero emission target. As for the state level policy interventions, uh, uh, we had the RE policy in 2016. Now we are coming out with the second 
ARI policy, where we'll have the non-fossil fuel uh, policy. For, in non-fossil fuel, we'll include the hydro, green uh, hydrogen, and all uh, new technologies in this. And we're keeping the innovation funds in this. What are the new technology? Uh, we'll uh, give some funding for the new projects, pilot projects in this. So we are looking forward to make this uh, policy it be in the draft stage. Uh, again, the price out of PwC is drafting it in consultation with different departments. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, we may be have, having some collaboration or inputs from the states of uh, USA. We have already implemented the uh, EV policy and having a target to reduce 20% of uh, EV vehicles share in the 2025. And uh, uh, the RPO front, we, uh, at the state, we are meeting the RPO obligations set by the state regulator. And uh, in the coming 2022, 20, 23, we'll be exceeding the RPO targets, uh, what is set by the state regulator, as well as the union government. Uh, as, as far as the, uh, these challenges are there, there are a few areas what we're seeing that the future potential for collaboration or uh, uh, so, uh, mutual uh, benefit uh, with the USA states or the, uh, USA uh, stakeholders uh, would be like we have uh, major coal-based uh, thermal plants. How we can be repurposing these plants? Uh, how, is there any study or any uh, initiative by the USA states or any stakeholder can do? The tariff-based uh, balancing is also another aspect because the <coughs> renewable uh, RTC power uh, able to make uh, it available with the storage and all it is becoming costlier for the heavy industries. So what kind of interventions or uh, uh, technology can be put so that uh, the tariff will be low and how it can be balancing to the uh, industries or the residential consumers they can buy the tariff of clean energy. Uh, other areas the green hydrogen we have already talked about so in the state level also we are keeping uh, a few of the policies in the uh, coming uh, coming of policy uh, where the green hydrogen will be uh, encouraged in the state uh, besides what the union government is giving the incentive and the uh, scheme provisions are there at the state level what we can do we can also provide in that the other area is uh, uh, how the shifting to the EVs and uh, the disaster resilient aspect to the clean energy because we often face the disasters, uh, we have uh, worked out how to meet the challenges of uh, uh, disasters and restore the electrical system within a very limited time. Within three, four days, we restore almost 99%. We have a uh, good system in place, protocols in place for the um, disasters as far as the how we save the life as well as the, uh, the net electrical network and restoration. Now, and the clean energy generation or uh, clean energy supply, how we can move uh, towards the disaster resiliency, that is another area uh, we are looking forward uh, for the collaboration if possible. So having said so, uh, we, as the state, uh, are making a robust policy to attract the investors and making the clean energy uh, acceptable to the consumers as well as the investors. And uh, for uh, that also we are uh, working on the capacity building at uh, various levels, uh, from the community to the uh, district level administration to the city level administration. And it's, uh, the, the plan is to make whole state move uh, together. And as uh, we are discussing a few minutes before, the cities will, will have also major role. And Bhuvaneshwar, the capital uh, city of uh, Odisha, we are making it fully uh, RE city, Bhuvaneshwar. And initially, we were making 50% consumption through RE, rooftop solar, and uh, other uh, sources, and we'll be moving forward. So these are a uh, few things from the Odisha perspective. I'll be happy to answer any query. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for those, those data points. Very interesting work going on. Um, I'll next turn it over to Robert Jackson, the director of the Energy Office for the state of Michigan here in the US. Oh. Thank you. So I'm not sure how much you know about Michigan, but it's a state of 10 million uh, people and 8 million active voters. And from that, there are a number of priorities. You know, one is, 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 is cost, uh, it's cheap, reliable energy. The other is transportation, 
Third's jobs in the, in, in the fourth uh, priority is really is health care, access to uh, meaningful health care. Um, it all has to be balanced in, in order to meet the needs of uh, Michiganders. Um, and, and it also has to be balanced with the sense that we have to focus on climate. You know, we know that there are issues that we need to resolve and there are extreme weather events which is impacting security, impacting uh, our energy production, and, and, and impacting jobs and our lives in, in, in Michigan. So the governor uh, has put in place which, what we call the My Healthy Climate Plan, and it's to reach carbon neutrality by the year 2050. And from the energy office's perspective, we're, we're trying to work in uh, five areas to, to do this, and one area is what we call callous communities, and that's working with local communities to uh, become carbon neutral and meet their uh, carbonization goals. And we're doing that by working in the building stock, uh, working on policy, uh, putting in case, place programs um, to work with local, local communities as well as with uh, you know, the uh, citizens within those, those, those cities uh, and within our state to help them um, become more efficient and help them um, be less reliable upon fossil fuel. The second area that we're working on and that we're, that we're doing um, is that we're, we're working with industry to help move industry towards a low carbon future. This, that transition, that transition is important. And to do that, we're focusing on fuel switching, uh, looking at bringing to these heavy uh, energy in, um, intensive industries um, low carbon fuels. We're looking at working with them to put in place uh, um, um, operations in in, in helping them uh, modify their, their processes in order to accept these new carbon, these low carbon fuels. And we're working with them to identify energy efficiency within their operation in order to lower their costs, become more efficient in how they, they, they make products, as well as looking at uh, options for low carbon feedstock. Um, and we're doing, it in, in, again, you know, those programs, and we're restarting uh, a program. We call it the Retired Engineers Technical Assistance Program. Uh, that program was set up under uh, Secretary Granholm when she was governor of Michigan, um, and that program is pretty effective. You know, it uses retired engineer scientists and, and technicians to really to work with industry to help them achieve their, um, their, low, their, their carbon, carbon neutrality goals. Um, the third area that we're working on, and we're very intensive about this, and that is ensuring that every Michigander has access to clean energy. Uh, and we're doing that through a number of programs, um, not only in terms of you know, building up the grid to uh, put more renewables online, but also working at the lower level, I mean at the community level, to put in community solar, uh, and then putting in uh, solar and storage uh, behind the meter in order to enable that to happen. The next area that we're working on is what we call just transportation. Um, we put a lot of effort into looking at how to make this transition to alternative fuel vehicles um, in light duty and in heavy duty. Uh, we began to, you know, several, a few years ago, put in place programs to uh, facilitate the adoption of electric vehicles. We call that program Charge Up Michigan, where we are thoughtfully building out an EV charging um, network across the state. Um, we started before the National uh, Electric Vehicles Initiative Program um, where we're looking at, you know, the placement of, of, of DC fast chargers across the, the state in order to enable uh, worry-free driving. But that's just for, you know, but that, that program only address, addresses just a certain segment of the population. So we're now looking at how do we transition these, these you know, mass transit into electric to, to electric vehicles. And so we have a number of programs that we're looking and putting in place to do that. I think one of the ones that you, you, you may have heard of recently, where we're looking at wireless charging for buses and other forms of mass transit uh, within our, our, our cities. And then the, um, the, the, the last area that we're, that we're, that we're working on is, is really is jobs. You know, everybody should have access to jobs. And that's really what our thinking in Michigan is that we need to design programs, internships, apprenticeships in order for all Michiganders to have access to a job and then more, 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 uh, more critically 
a clean energy job so that they're part of this transition to this new energy future that we're building to service uh, the people of Michigan. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sandy. Thank you, Robert. Next up, Joanna Troy with the state of Massachusetts. Is this, oh, it's on already. I didn't even have to flip a switch. Um, hello, um, I'm representing uh, the state of Massachusetts today and so happy to be on this panel. And thank you to NASIO and CSIS for um, hosting us. I, I love events like this where we get to sort of share our uh, best practices and learn from the other states. Um, Massachusetts, uh, for those who are less familiar with the American states, um, Massachusetts is part of a regional or subnational electric grid um, in New England. We are one of six states in the northeast of America, um, and Massachusetts is the most populous state in, in um, uh, New England, and we roughly about half the electrical load is associated with our state, um, but we are one of six states that operate on that grid. Um, we are a relatively cold climate area, um, so generally our energy demand is uh, a winter heavy demand um, that is associated with heating. Currently, the majority of heating in uh, Massachusetts is done through natural gas, so that is one big um, policy area for us. Um, our electric system, though, is a summer peaking electric system because of air conditioning load. Um, we are currently in a heat wave uh, today, and so I would expect that uh, there's a lot of monitoring of the electrical system today in New England. Um, so it's about uh, transitioning um, our heating load and our transportation load, uh, which is mostly met through gasoline to the electric sector, and that will uh, result in a large transition of our electric sector from a summer peaking system, likely to a winter peaking system as we transition people onto electric, uh, electric heat. Um, Massachusetts has been a leader in many of, I think, the, what we would identify as early clean energy areas. So we were a leader in rooftop solar, community solar, uh, net metering, um, we were and are a leader in energy efficiency across the nation, but I think that right now what we're seeing is a change from our energy office implementing sort of distinct um, programs that are grants or programs specifically for solar or grants specifically for energy efficiency into something that's maybe more comprehensive and more focused on planning and more focused on integrating clean energy policies into economics, um, into you know, what do we want Massachusetts to look like in 2050? We often talk about uh, you know, a net zero or a carbon neutral commitment by 2050. Sometimes I think it's always funny that I think the world's gonna end in 2050 because my entire job is to get to 2050. Um, but when we think about hitting a clean energy or a carbon neutral target that far out, yes, clean and yes, energy is driving it there, but what 2050 looks like in terms of access, in terms of economy, in terms of equitably, equitable access to programs, to what new technologies um, can bring, it's, it's about thinking about that comprehensively. So our energy office may have been um, focused on you know, something like the RPS program, a renewable portfolio standard focused on compliance, and we are now shifting that towards focusing on transportation and focusing on sort of a whole access for people's homes. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's my introduction to Massachusetts, but happy to answer any um, more specific questions. Thank you, Joanna, that was great. Last but not least, Ari Gerstman with Washington, D.C. So um, for those of you not familiar with the United States, uh, the District of Columbia is not a state, though in many ways we behave like a state under the Home Rule Act and in terms of energy, we're not at all dissimilar from a state. And I work for the district government the, that administers our state energy office. Uh, and what's nice also is that we're a municipal government at the same time, so we get to achieve a lot of efficiencies of having state and municipal government in one. Um, and in particularly in the areas of energy and energy assistance, uh, many of the energy assistance programs in the United States are run on the local level, and so we're able to do that seamlessly, uh, both through state and municipal government at the same time, which is really uh, fantastic. DC is 69 square miles. We have about 700, 750,000 people, so it's not terribly dissimilar from Delhi and the, and the NCT, except where 
you know, an eighth of the population and a 15th of the size, but that's pretty similar for, for the US and India, right? So um, uh, uh, the, the gentleman from the State Department talked a little bit about the importance of renewable energy portfolio standards. Uh, DC had one of the first RPSs in the country in 2004, so our solar industry here is extremely mature. Um, our RPS is unique in that uh, we have no power plants in the district, and so we uh, have a solar carve-out. Uh, by 2041, 10% of the electricity consumed in the District of Columbia has to be created in the District of Columbia. Um, and we meet that goal year over year uh, through uh, s solar renewable energy credits and a very healthy, tradable solar renewable energy credits that the suppliers participate in. Um, and that is what incentivizes and drives our solar industry here. Obviously, the vast majority of solar here is rooftop. Um, because there's not a lot of vacant land. The little bit of vacant land that there is is brownfields often, and so we do do ground mount solar there. Um, we're very successful in community solar. Uh, most people, especially in the low and moderate income area, um, do not own their own house and, and even live in multifamily buildings, so they don't have a roof. Um, community solar is a great way for them to participate in solar energy without having to put solar on their roofs. Um, one of the problems with RPS is the renewable energy portfolio standards and electricity in general is that it's regressive. Um, the, uh, every energy user pays the same amount uh, for solar energy in the district regardless if they're wealthy or poor. So we use um, the compliance payments for non-compliance with our RPS uh, to drive solar for the low and moderate income community through our Solar for All program. Uh, 8,000 families here in the district are enrolled in it and we give them about $500 a year off of their electricity bills through community solar. Uh, and that's been really successful. Um, we have the national leading building energy performance standard, which is one of the only sticks in the, in the clean energy uh, pipeline and policy mix for the United States. The vast majority, almost everything you've heard of from both the Indian government and the US government is carrots, right? Like, we'll give you a little bit of money or we'll give you a tax credit or we'll facilitate something. Building energy performance standards is that if your building is not at the median or below for energy consumption, you are going to have to retrofit your building or pay a fine. Um, and that is extremely aggressive. Uh, as you can imagine, we don't have a lot of friends in the building owner community, uh, especially now in the age of COVID, as uh, a lot of our commercial real estate has seen vacancy rates that you haven't seen in decades. Um, but it's working uh, because it's understandable, it's predictable, um, and we have a very, very strong social and political will here to meet our net zero energy target. And since buildings uh, produce about 75% of our carbon emissions here in the district, it, it has to happen through the buildings. Uh, and so we're very um, excited about uh, the energy savings that BEPS will bring along. I'm very, very excited that you are at the point now in India where um, you are about to see your demand really skyrocket. And, and the minister uh, mentioned earlier that, that you saw a 15% rise in, in energy consumption over the past year. It's fabulous that you can think about demand management now. Um, and that you can build demand management, energy budgeting, et cetera, into your growth plans and into um, the prosperity that is coming to your country uh, so that you can build the grid and really only build the assets that are necessary uh, going forward. Um, you know, a lot of the problems we have in America is that we have legacy systems that need to be retrofitted. You guys can leapfrog us because you're at the beginning. Um, and that's extremely valuable. Um, one thing I will also add that's a very important program here is that um, we all know that the climate change impacts are going to impact the most vulnerable in our society. Um, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to suffer from climate change impacts. And so uh, a lot of um, 
lower income and uh, historically neglected communities are in floodplains. A lot of them are in urban heat islands where their energy burden from air conditioning is worse than the wealthier communities. Um, and so we are building a program uh, based on resilience hubs where we work with community centers to put battery and solar at the community center. We make sure there's an operating kitchen. We make sure that there are people in the community who know how to use the facility. And we make sure that there's program uh, during non um, you know, catastrophe days so that uh, the facility gets used for the community and it can build resilience in the community and attack many of the different problems with social vulnerability, not just energy needs. Um, but at these resilience hubs during a blackout, you can charge your phone, you can store breast milk and medicine in a refrigerator, you can cook, etc. cetera. Uh, they're often co-located with urban agriculture so that really in, in the worst of occasions, the community can come together and rely on itself for at least a little bit. Um, and, th and I think that's really, really, uh, valuable. Um, one thing that's strange about the district is that we have no power plants, we have no heavy industry, and so as a result, we don't look to hydrogen. We're really looking at electricity. We're looking exclusively electricity, and we think we can meet our RPS uh, through electricity, through, uh, you know, I'll say now conventional renewable energy uh, uh, programs, and so we're really excited about that. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk to you about the district. Thank you so much, Ari. It's always exciting to get to talk about conventional renewable energy, so it's nice that we're at that stage in the market. Um, I did want to start with Joanna. I was excited to learn recently that through CSIS, Massachusetts had the chance to connect with Tamil Nadu. Um, and I'd love for you to share about your experiences and what you observed about similarities and differences between states here in the US and in India, maybe just to help set the stage for the rest of the discussion. Of course. Um, yes, I, I had the opportunity to travel to Tamil Nadu with a delegation from Massachusetts in October of 2019. I'm looking at Afina because she was our leader on that trip. Um, it was fantastic. Uh, I think when, when you work in state government, um, you do sometimes have a tendency to be so focused on your own state needs um, that you know sometimes we get invited into the national conversation, but I, I think it's pretty rare that we get invited into an international conversation. Um, and so it was it was really um, important, I think, to my growth in thinking of uh, energy problems to be able to go on that trip. The the two differences that I sort of saw that sort of took me by surprise when I went to Tamil Nadu, one was the, the wind penetration. Um, and because we, in Massachusetts, very focused on growing our offshore wind industry. We have a great offshore wind resource off our coast. We don't actually have any steel in the ground yet, though. So we actually don't have a lot of wind penetration. We have a lot of wind opportunity. Um, and to see some of the... Um, the numbers um, from the grid planners in Tamil Nadu uh, showing the wind penetration numbers was was remarkable and the concerns around forecasting and the concerns around balancing, which I do think um, we are going to face, uh, Massachusetts and New England is going to face when we start having a lot of that offshore wind online. So I think that's one area where we have a lot to learn um, from, from India uh, in how to tackle forecasting a wind penetration. Um, the other challenge that I sort of saw, which I don't know why I didn't anticipate this, but I hadn't really thought about it, um, which was in Massachusetts, every customer is connected to electricity. It's, it already exists. I think you refer to it as a legacy system. Many of, uh, uh, many of our, we actually have the problem that our grid is, some of it was built in 1900. So we actually have parts of our electrical system are over 100 years old. And we're going in and rehabbing that sometimes for the second first time in some instances. Um, so to see uh, a lot of the innovation happening on, I think you called it, uh, someone called it uh, decentralized renewable energy? C citizen centered, yes. Um, and I thought that was really innovative. And I one of the takeaways I got is that m many of us on the state level are trying to deal with this particular concerns of our citizens and the particular needs. Um, but we all have the same toolkit. So I spend a lot of time thinking about solar and storage. Um, generally, we think about it in terms of like a grid interactive building or maybe a net zero building or a passive house. But then to see the same tools and the same technologies being utilized to address a, a different 
problem, which was that um, you know there are areas that needed to be electrified or needed to have greater resiliency or greater reliability. Um, I thought it was interesting that we're all pulling from the same new technologies um, and that it's innovation and in utilizing the same tools that's really going to drive some of the, the problem identification. Thank you so much. That's that's very helpful context setting. Um, Mr. Swine, Mr. Dubé, and Mr. Verma, if you have any further thoughts to add on what our audience here in the U.S. should know about India, India's state politics and policies, uh, feel free to weigh in. Um, I would also like to invite everybody to comment on um, the challenges and obstacles that you see ahead um, in meeting some of these very ambitious clean energy and climate goals. We've heard of a few um, resilience, or I should say lack of resilience um, to natural disasters, um, just the sheer cost. Uh, but I would appreciate your insights on, on that matter too. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Dubé and Mr. Verma. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, once again, thank you for inviting me. Uh, there are a few points that I would like to, and, uh, to add, and particularly after hearing the speakers from Massachusetts, uh, Michigan, and uh, Washington. Uh, the issue that I, uh, uh, and uh, in, a, in a state like Madhya Pradesh, uh, when, when we have to have about 50% of penetration of renewable energy, we are facing and we will be facing in the coming future would be uh, that if we have to have that much of a renewable energy policy, there has to be a land as a resource which should be available in abundance. Uh, as we go on, uh, you would realize that for us to achieve that and based on the projections of the demand that would come in 2030, we would have to have about 12,000 uh, megawatt of additional renewable energy sources generated for which we need to have uh, land as a source. And that is why we are looking for an alternative sources whereby Thankfully, we are having abundance of water bodies to convert uh, or to use the water surfaces to have a floating uh, solar uh, parks, and that would probably uh, mitigate the requirement for the land. The second aspect that I want to consistently make is that as we go, uh, go and have more and more of vanilla solar parks, we would have to have uh, shift our uh, demand to the solar arts until as we are able to match that uh, no state would have that kind of a transmission capability of uh, peaking in a daytime and then suddenly going down in the evening and the early hours. So while we look at the generation capacities, we also would have to see as to how uh, we are faring in terms of the transmission capabilities and are we able to shift our demand during the solar hours or in the wind hours so as to make sure that um, the matching of the demand and supply happens. And that is where a lot of technological interventions are required. The states are moving ahead. The central government is also forced and helping us. The third thing that I want to say is about the decentralized uh, energy generation. And it's not only in the urban areas that we are looking at with the rooftop solar, but we are also looking at um, the, every uh, farmer generating their own electricity to uh, supply the electricity to the pumps for uh, lifting the water from the ground. So because of that, there is a policy of the government of India with the Kusum A, Kusum B, and Kusum C, whereby the investors, the farmers, the cooperatives, the federations, the local uh, elected bodies, they all can come and set up a very small to a higher level uh, or a, uh, heavy capacities of uh, these uh, parks or uh, plants. So right from 500 kilowatt to up to 10 megawatt uh, kind of a plants are coming up in the rural areas of uh, Madhya Pradesh. And that will... Uh, First, it will ensure that the electricity is available during the daytime. The second is that uh, there will be less demand uh, or the requirement of a transmission capabilities. And third, the, uh, third and the most important is we will have less of losses in transmission and dealing. So these are the other areas that uh, would generally will be of help to us uh, when we talk about the renewable energy sources. And that would give the perspective that Madhya Pradesh is moving ahead. And we are also um, trying to build the first uh, hydro green hydro uh, generation and green ammonia generation within the state. And hopefully by the end of this year, we should be in position to start a work onto these areas also. So we are looking holistically in uh, various ways of uh, use, uh, increasing the usage of renewable energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Verma? Uh, yes, thank you, Sandy. Uh, so, as I told earlier, 
Assam doesn't have a natural advantage compared to other states. So our focus is on the strategy and sustainability. So we want to have uh, RE investment in Assam to the extent possible, not uh, to a large, large level. We are also identifying areas where RE is possible elsewhere. So for example, we, are, we have sent a team to Rajasthan to see if we can set up a plant there and we can uh, drop out from there. We have had tie, tie up with uh, Uttar Pradesh and we are in fact one of the plant uh, we have invested 20% uh, so that uh, we, we can get power from them. Uh, we, our focus is on a rooftop and uh, as uh, Mr. Dubey has said, uh, in Assam also we are focusing on decentralized generation. We have thousands of tea gardens and uh, they have got a good amount of land which is unused. So we have just changed the land uses so that uh, they can have uh, solar plants in their tea gardens. Uh, we have uh, uh, have uh, had a joint venture with uh, some PSUs like NLCs and uh, apart from solar, we are also going for investments, not only in Assam, but elsewhere also uh, in other uh, neighboring states for hydro projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, please do add. Mm -hmm. uh, one is that on the uh, policy intervention on this, uh, uh, the state, uh, we have made the RE regulation through uh, Odisha Illicit Regulatory Commission, uh, having uh, all the facility of uh, virtual net metering and uh, group uh, net metering, all facility for the encouragement of the rooftop solar and group solarization. Besides that, also the state is also taking off uh, the uh, floating solar in a big way because the land is an issue and in the Odisha is uh, major land is uh, agricultural land or uh, industrial lands. <coughs> to get the land like Rajasthan and the states, it's difficult. So we are planning of a mega uh, uh, floating solar in uh, the water bodies. We have uh, big size water bodies in the state. And it is becoming a little bit uh, uh, costier vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, land-based uh, solar uh, generation, but we are, having uh, uh, policy intervention and the government intervention, how to reduce that cost of generation. And third point is that in uh, Odisha, we had been successful in community involvement in meeting the disaster situations and, uh, and uh, various uh, uh, social movements or activities. So in this also, uh, when we are making the energy action plan, the uh, uh, society involvement, the community involvement, we are also keeping in in eye in by the different uh, departments because uh, all our actions or the uh, government services uh, channelized through the uh, those uh, community involvements, the self-help groups, NGOs, they are uh, largely involved, and particularly when the, we take the major steps uh, in in a very short time, their involvements gives uh, a big input or dividend to us. So for that uh, energy action plan also, we are making community involvement uh, by the departments. Uh, when uh, we're having the 20 departments to work on the energy action plan for 2040, uh, the one uh, major area we have kept for the community involvement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joanna, Ari, uh, Robert, anything to add on challenges or? Well, I think just from just the panel today, I've heard the challenge a number of times and it's consistent with, I think, the U.S. states and the Indian states, which has been land use siting. Um, despite having space in, in some areas, that that is not where people live, right? So putting a lot of generation um, in areas where there is no load is a real challenge. So when you start thinking about a centralized system, how do we get... Uh, generation and load to match up, um, not just spatially, but also time-wise. Um, you know, we're, we're exploring offshore wind because that does solve a lot of our siting problems by putting our generation um, where uh, uh, people are not living, but then that creates an interconnection problem that creates a transmission problem. Um, we're talking about demand growth. Uh, that's going to require um, investment in infrastructure, both in, in the U.S. and in India. So, what, what do the additions of lines uh, look like? What is a transmission siting um, concern? So um, I think that's a challenge for all of us. Um, even, even in Massachusetts, though, we have a very strong stakeholder uh, engagement and support for clean energy policies. 
Um, I think people are going to see over the next 30 years what what the implementation of a clean energy policy is actually going to physically look like. And that's going to take a lot of stakeholder engagement. That's going to take a lot of um, education. It's going to be also a challenge for um, uh, for us as policymakers to ensure that it happens equitably. Um, I would add, I, I just in terms of, of renewable penetration, it, it the thing that I've heard the most from uh, all of the uh, representatives of the Indian government is that storage continues to be the bottleneck. Um, and so I, I would encourage you to tackle that problem with vehicle electrification at the same time. And the reason why is that um, I, I wouldn't think of an electric car or a heavy duty electric truck as a truck. I would think about it as a battery that also has a transportation capacity. And so if you look at the frontier um, of, of your grid where there might be rolling brownouts or where there's a, a real need for storage, rather than thinking about stationary storage interconnected with the community there, you could potentially think about vehicles as um, a, a, a resource that can both provide transportation and grid capacity at the same time um, and make sure that you have vehicle to grid policies and programs that will enable a, a 200 kilowatt hour fully charged truck to, um, to power a, a small village for a period of time uh, rather than giving them the brownout and figuring out where you can re recharge that truck maybe 20, 30 miles away. Um, and, and that could be an enormous opportunity for, for you to solve your storage problem and have it really be very flexible as because um, you can move those assets around very easily. My, my colleagues have, have really have, have said exactly, you know, have expressed views that I guess that, that I share and, and really talks about the issue. Um, so from my perspective, I think we have to rethink about the grid, the future. You know, we look at, you know, grid upgrades, we look at, you know, how do we put more renewable energy on the grid. In doing that, we have the, you know, the, the local politics issues, we have siting. Uh, there are a lot of issues that, that impact our ability to the site and, and to um, put this, the, the new renewables on, on the grid, especially in Michigan as we look towards meeting our, our carbon neutrality goals by 2050. So from my perspective, I think we have to rethink the grid and rethink it in a way that really is more innovative uh, and at the same time more challenging. We have to look at more microgrids. We have to look at more rooftop solar. Uh, we have to look at more community solar. Uh, we have to look at more community wind where those areas support it. But there are the challenges. There are the security challenges, you know, cybersecurity. There's the interconnection uh, challenges. But those are things that we can handle. I think that we can, that through innovation and through the rethinking of how we approach this whole idea, is that we will be able to um, reduce the, you know, reduce our, our, our need for energy as well as reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, all great points. Um, as uh, Mr. Dubé and uh, Robert, you were speaking, it, it struck me that U.S. and India both have very vibrant private sectors um, that can be leveraged as partners uh, in the energy transition. Uh, Mr. Du Dubé, you mentioned demand forecasting and some of the work uh, around AI. Uh, Robert, you mentioned the, the retired um, the professionals program. Uh, I'm curious how each of your states is sort of working with industry partners to to help support your goals or help support their goals as well, um, and whether you're finding you know receptive audiences there. So, I guess I could start. So two years ago, we as we began to look at putting together a climate plan for for the state of Michigan, uh, I co-chaired a group that looked at uh, how to you know with, looked at energy uses which, within. Uh, energy intensive industries. And so we met with all sectors of industry, talking with them about, you know, the challenges that they were facing um, in terms of, you know, their operations uh, and the challenge of, of how to meet our, our climate goals. And what, what came out through those discussions were really three, three areas. One was, yes, energy, industry knew it needed to transition into a low carbon fuel, but electricity wasn't going to help in certain 
certain industrial sectors. So we needed more um, high BTU fuel in order for that to happen, and that was really carbon, I mean, uh, hydrogen. In, but that was a challenge in itself because Michigan doesn't have a hydrogen hub there. Um, and then there were other ideas about, you know, if we were able, if utilities were able to deliver a low carbon fuel to the meter, then what challenges that were in that manufacturer that would, would, would prevent them um, from using that fuel? Or, and I guess the other opposite way you look at it is that uh, what needed to be done with their processes in order to uh, efficiently utilize that low carbon fuel. And then the second area that we were looking at was, you know, the energy efficiency component of it. You know, these were all age processes, processes that needed to be improved, um, and we knew that uh, and to further drive or, or, or facilitate um, the, 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 the lowering the carbon footprint within an industrial sector, we know we needed to um, to look at lowering the, the carbon in the feedstock that these industries, industrial sectors were using. And you know, two things really came up there. One is that we needed to move towards a circular economy. Uh, we needed to look at you know, those materials that were in the recycling stream that we could extract from it and manipulate and, re and, and process and reuse in our manufacturing operations. And then the second area, and that's the area that we're focusing on now, is restarting the Retired Engineers Technical Assistance Program. And that program will enable us to send these retired engineers into these industrial sectors to work on very complex issues, and not only in terms of you know, doing you know, energy, assist energy audits, but also working with them to look at you know, what needed to be done in that manufacturing sector, within that manufacturer uh, and the products that they were manufacturing to become more efficient and optimize their processes. Um, to a degree that will reduce their energy use and therefore in, uh, lower the uh, climate impacts. So those are really, you know, things that, that we're looking at within manufacturers uh, as well as, you know, we have the retired engineers and we're coupling in that with an internship program that will actually place the interns in these manufacturers to work on the projects throughout the summer and um, to hopefully uh, aid not only in that company's um, ability to become more efficient and reduce their, their energy needs, but also gives the students an opportunity for training and for learning that would help them uh, build in their career. Thank you, Robert. Really interesting model. Mr. Dubay, did you have anything to add um, from your perspective? Yeah, I'll just say two things uh, that are important uh, uh, points other than what uh, the speakers have just spoken about. One is that uh, if you see the trajectory that uh, Madhya Pradesh uh, has followed, within a decade from 2% 2 to 25% of uh, uh, um, installed capacity in renewable energy has come essentially through the private investment. Uh, government, uh, whether the state government or the central government, has only worked as a facilitator. So we are uh, providing a facility of plug and play, but the investment really has come from the private sector. And that includes not from within the state, but also from outside the state as well as from the outside the country. So uh, actually the environment for the investment in Madhya Pradesh as well as in the country has, uh, in the renewable sector has uh, gone up substantially. People are finding it very convenient and particularly because of the systems in place like payment security guarantee, the funds that are being uh, provided for, the letter of credit. All of these give a confidence to the investor that if they are going to invest money in Madhya Pradesh, they will be paid for in time and that uh, brings up the uh, lowest tariff possible. So that is one of the points that uh, we continue to have the policy interventions, the program interventions, which uh, encourage people to come and set their shop up, uh, have an MOU and um, get, uh, get um, an agreement done with us and start working with us. And the second thing that to make uh, this more attractive, uh, we are also working for a, a carbon credit uh, um, uh, monetization because of which we have been able to generate sufficient amount of money. And lastly, that we have to say, because of the widespread within the state, uh, there is a complementarity of the demand between the different states. So I have seasons when I have a high demand, particularly in the winter uh, months, while there are states which have a lower demand during those times. So we are now contemplating to have renewable energy round the clock sources, which is partially shared by one state in for about six months and partially it is shared by another state for six months. And that is where 
the tendering process and innovation is happening. So what I try to say is that we are looking at policy initiatives, we are looking at the program initiatives, and we are working more as a facilitator for the investment to get attracted rather than doing it ourselves, everything, because we understand that we in the process have to learn. And it's, um, it's very, very good to uh, listen to all the speakers from, uh, um, from US that what they are doing, and there are a lot of learnings that we will take back home. Uh, and particularly uh, battery as not as a storage, but also as a transport uh, mechanism to be utilizing for the purpose of, uh, for supply of energy. So uh, in, uh, in some, to sum up, up, I would just say that uh, everybody and anybody is uh, welcome in uh, Madhya Pradesh. And we would be very uh, interested that if there is a technological uh, exchange of uh, information, exchange of uh, technologies that is happening within the US and any other part of the world, we would be very welcoming. And you would find it very, very convenient to operate in Madhya Pradesh and particularly uh, in, in the state, uh, which are uh, doing some good work in the development. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. Any other comments? One thing, um, we have a lot of interest. Uh, I think Massachusetts is very similar to, to DC and that the majority of our private sector, uh, our industry is not manufacturing, it's not agricultural, it's, it's generally services and offices and corporations. Um, so one, it is convincing a lot of corporations um, or building developers that that achieving net zero is actually in their financial best interest. Um, so a lot of demonstration projects of zero net energy buildings um, and showing sort of the operational benefits of, of achieving that. And then second, there is a lot of interest from companies and corporations to participate in our procurements in our markets. Um, there is a great interest uh, to identify areas on the grid um, that are low impact. So we want to drive development to where we already have the infrastructure to support that development. So I think there is a increasing transparency around the state policy planning um, and increasing um, the ability for private corporations to participate. So Massachusetts is exploring um, proposing a a clean energy market um, to integrate with our wholesale markets. Right now, the majority of clean energy procured is done exclusively through our utilities, exclusively through state legislature. Um, but what does a market look like where companies could come and add on top of what Massachusetts is achieving through our utilities and really have them be part of the clean energy future? Um, but it's going to require a lot of market um, reform. I would just say in terms of uh, the private sector, first and foremost, you know, if there are any Indian companies that need an American presence, they should definitely <laughs> locate here in the District of Columbia. It's a, a fast growing and exciting place to be. Um, but I, I, I think also one of the things that this, this might be interesting to some of you, but um, because our solar industry started so young here in the district, that when we talk about clean energy in the district and we talk about clean energy in the industry, they are the voice that, that is enormous and crowds out everyone else, for better or for worse. Um, and so oftentimes when we turn to industry, they are overrepresented and their response is, oh, solar can solve that. And so I, I, would, I would encourage you as, as you're thinking about you know, how to incentivize industry, um, to, to incentivize as much diversity within that industry as possible, both um, in term, you know, to be able to create competition within service and product lines, but also within energy, you know, within the entire energy portfolio, so that there can be varying different um, energy solutions brought to bear to these unique, unique and different problems. You guys have an exceptionally diverse climate, just like we do. Um, there are going to be really different solutions from place to place. So make sure that all of those members of industry grow at the same time and at the same rate so that it doesn't um, you know, become captured by, by just one. Great, great points. Any final words from, from your perspective, Mr. Swine? Uh, on the on the, uh, uh, the aspect of uh, promoting the industries uh, for the RE, uh, I mean uh, there are uh, certain difficulties uh, in in cost of their generation in in our state. 
So uh, what are the incentives uh, the states uh, in the USA are providing for these industries uh, so that their uh, cost of generation will be you know, competitive? What kind of support you are extending here that uh, can you just enumerate a few? Yeah, wonderful note to end on. Um, thank you all so much for tuning into this session. Thank you to our amazing speakers, both here and in India. Uh, we really appreciate your expert insights. Uh, next up to help us introduce the, the final speaker, our keynote for the day, um, is Kelly Smith-Burke, uh, the chair of NASIO's board um, and, uh, and the energy office director in the state of Florida. So please uh, join me in thanking our panel and welcoming our next speaker. Thank you, Sandy. And before we jump into our next and final session of this morning, I just want to thank uh, CSIS and NASIO um, for putting this event together. Um, I don't know about you, but I found these panels this morning to be very informative, um, and I appreciate all of the speakers who were able to join us to share their insights um, of what's going on, not only in their states, but their organizations. So thank you both. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce, um, as I said, the final speaker for this morning's sessions, uh, Mr. Vikas Mehta. Um, he's the executive director of the SED Fund. Um, many of us know the SED Fund through Kartikeya Singh, who helped launch the US-India initiative a few years ago while still here at CSIS, and who now supports our continued partnership um, at the SED Fund. Um, Mr. Mehta is a founding executive board member of the said fund as executive director. He manages new portfolio and capacity development and global strategic initiatives. Um, previously, he spent 17 years in impact investment and program management with international nonprofits in Asia and Africa, uh, working across clean energy, agriculture, microfinance, and ICT initiatives. Um, so Vikas, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate um, both you and Kartikeya and um, the SED Fund for helping us bring together this important group for this um, this conversation and discussion today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for thanking Kartike as well. He's not here with us today. Uh, he's uh, sitting in The Hague looking to move back to Washington, DC. Uh, for his new gig, but uh, he's definitely uh, someone who's been very instrumental uh, in bringing us to where we are as far as SET fund, um, and I'm sure even CS, as far as CSIS is concerned. But before I start, I just want to thank uh, NASIO, CSIS, and all the Indian delegates who have come halfway across the world to really participate in this discussion. I'd really appreciate you coming here and sharing your wisdom with us. The discussions, uh, the way they have gone since this morning, I mean, have told us one thing which is that uh, climate change, um, irrespective of the historical emissions, wherever they may have come from, um, it's a threat to all of us, everyone in this world. What we are seeing right now in the southwest of the US droughts, what we are seeing in the heat waves uh, happening in Europe, happening in Asia, and uh, the conditions are not gonna get any better. The geopolitical tensions have certainly added to the whole flavor, but uh, let's face it, the threat is here to stay. But on a positive note, I'll say one more thing. Climate change is also the biggest investment opportunity that we all will see in our lifetimes. Simply for the fact that the need for uh, energy efficiency and energy access are not gonna reduce from here. Uh, Mr. Jagdale said that uh, the uh, energy use and the demand in India is only gonna grow. And so it is for most countries in Asia and Africa and Latin America. Every single country in the global south will need those electrons to come from somewhere before they can actually provide access to all of their populations. And mark my words, electrons it will be. And when we talk about electrons, we have to talk about electrifying everything. And for that to happen, I think there's a certain degree of ambition which has to come from the governments, the civil society, and the private sector, which is what uh, led us to create SET Fund in 2018, in which uh, the idea was that we've had a lot of discussions at the COPS, um, 
for decades almost talking about climate finance, but where does the climate finance really come from? Does it have to come only from the governments? And if yes, then how long will it take? How will we create those packages which will work for the developing economies? As we speak right now, we see a, a package being discussed for South Africa, which was announced last year as part of the JetP partnerships. But uh, it is facing its own challenges right now, which are multilateral, which are uh, rooted in uh, looking at where does the fair share really comes from, and how do you deploy that capital? So SET Fund was really set up as a philanthropic initiative to support the de-risking, and I repeat the word de-risking, of climate finance coming into the global south. And India being a key country for us, we have been looking to support a lot of initiatives which look at how do you kind of de-risk the investments in clean energy so that we leapfrog uh, our economy and our populations into clean energy uh, revolution rather than talking about burning fossil fuels that destroy climate as my seven-year-old son says. So I think it's important that uh, we look at the sub-national engagements at the US level, at the India level, with a lens which talks about not just international partnerships, but partnerships for the world. These partnerships are important because all of the stakeholders which are present in this room, they are the ones who are gonna give the fruition to whatever discussions happen in this room. They have to be converted into policy instruments. They have to be converted into investment instruments. And the discourse has to kind of change along with that. And signal has to come from every single person in this room. Um, as far as said is concerned, we have already started to uh, support the process in India for at least the last four years. And we have done some, uh, hopefully, I would say, credible work with states like Gujarat, for example, in terms of working their utility on how do you go about the clean energy transition for the whole state. Uh, we have uh, supported the just transition efforts uh, with IIT Kanpur, with the West Bengal Innovation Network, looking at how do you provide uh, states like West Bengal, Jharkhand, uh, and even in Chhattisgarh, the Green Council, how do you transform these states into green states, not just dependent on the fossil fuels, but also on the green economy for the future? How do you make these states future ready? It's very important that uh, you know, everybody kind of comes together for this, and the leverage and the partnerships that NASIO areas have gotten together, I think it really provides impetus to a lot of this effort at the state level. Um, I would just say one thing that uh, I remain thankful to everyone in this room uh, for the efforts you do every single day to make this world a better place. And I only hope that you will raise your ambitions from here. Thank you so much. Uh, well, what an amazing day that we've had here so far. I mean, from Under Secretary Turk's call for action and noting how much uh, in common the U.S. and India general approaches to a lot of these issues, um, to then hearing that also um, reiterated uh, by you, sir, by um, Mr. Jagdale, just talking about India's you know, overall challenges and that the fact that really came out a lot during the panel is that you're also transitioning to electricity, which is a challenge and also an opportunity. Uh, and then I think the quote I'm gonna take away is David, David Terry's notice that if you see one state, you see one state. And I think that came out very much. But there's also, in addition to just getting an amazing overview of the different approaches and challenges, whether geography, technology, population, um, Weather patterns, you know, there's, there, are, there was, I sense, a lot of uh, coming together about recognizing common challenges and ways that could be cooperating, that you all could be cooperating, and even some suggestions about how to start doing that. So we very much hope that uh, today is just a beginning. Um, it's a continuation, but also maybe new energy being provided to uh, this level of cooperation, both between um, states and their centers, and center to center, and most importantly, for our purposes, state to state. So thank you very much for coming. I think Sandy's just gonna give us one admin note, and then we'll be on our way. Thanks again.
Great, thank you so much, Kathy. I did want to do uh, one quick extra thank you to Kartikeya Singh with the SED Fund, who's been an incredible supporter of this initiative since he worked at CSIS and traveled to India and made all these amazing connections and really helped get the ball rolling. Um, so Kartikeya, if you're out there, um, thank you. <laughs> and yes, please join me in. <laughs> Um, we'll now be adjourning the morning portion of the meeting. Um, for those of you who will be sticking around for our invitation-only afternoon um, discussions, please uh, follow uh, CSIS staff, uh, and we'll get you escorted to the right room. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining today, uh, both in person and online. We're so grateful to all, to all of you for um, tuning in and sharing your expertise uh, and being part of this conversation.